Blog Talk Radio. He did say 
that he usually ices his his arm or bicep or whatever the hell, right? And they asked him in an interview, hey, is your arm okay? He's like, oh, yeah, this is normal. So to me, it kind of put me at ease, the fact that he'd be on camera so much with the towel on, on his arm. You know, it, it was a little funky. You, you just don't normally see that. But to be honest with you, how many times do we get, like, insight, you know, inside, you know, Ugas's camps? Really, you know? Um He's gotten two uh, major Fox exposure, one with Porter and one with DeLorme on the uh, Mayweather-McGregor prelims. Those were two big ratings there, but it's not like you were normally seeing him ice his arm, you know, like he said. So, yeah, I got to admit, I was a little like, oh, but like I said, I'm glad I put my money down early in the week, and I backed it up with a distance. So um, so I thought I was good to go either way. I didn't see a knockout on either side of it. But what a great performance. And, yes, Manny did look faded, looked old in, the, in there. And he says, you know, with his legs or whatever. We've heard that one, you know, numerous times. But you can't really take away credit because going in, you knew Pacquiao hadn't been in the ring in, in over two years technically. So you can't take away credit from Ugas. You know, he uh, – he did his job, and, and he didn't just fight an old Manny, and that's it. I mean, Manny was, you know, he didn't have a, hot, a lot of head movement. A lot of people have talked about that. He wasn't as explosive as we've seen him. But even in those early rounds that we'll get to here in just a moment, he did tag Ugas plenty. And uh, there was some, like I say, shaky moments possibly buzzed moments where you're like, oh boy, yeah, his whole body moved a little bit on that one. I'm not sure. Is he good? He's good. Okay, he's fine, you know? So, um, but yeah, I mean, Ugas had the game plan and the undercard, you know, overall, um, Pacquiao Ugas, we talked about this last week, overall, you know, having that as a pay-per-view um, for, a, you know, a fairly high, high price, right? Even though we're used to paying these high prices now, it did kind of like, I don't know, it was kind of like, damn, you know, you wish that it could somehow not be on pay-per-view or, or not not really that. It's really just maybe put it down to 50 bucks or whatever. Um, but, you know, gone are the days, especially the amount of minimum that he has is guaranteed. Uh, is at least 10 million. You know, people say 30 or 40 or, you know, I, I don't know if it's 20. I don't know if it's, you know, what he was getting 30 or I, I have no clue. And no one really knows exactly as of right now, anyway, what he got um, or he even got as, you know, with a late substitute. I don't know. Obviously they say, you know, save some money with Spence's side of it. That's for sure. But there was a time where this would have just been on, you know, regular, you know, um, there has been pay-per-views in the past that when the, the two fighters that you, you schedule the pay-per-view with, if it's not postponed, if it's a serious injury, there has been times where, you know, we, we have gotten it downgraded off pay-per-view and we've gotten fights where I remember HBO used to do just one fight like, uh, uh, Cotto and was it Cotto and Rodriguez? I know, um, Mosley and Margarito was just the one fight that night because they said we didn't want it on pay-per-view, but we can't afford an undercard. You know, in the end, obviously, we talked about a variety of things that we wish or whatever last week, but the postponement really wasn't on the table in my mind just because of the severity of Spence's, you know, injury. Whether he's back in six months or a year or whatever, um, you can't just postpone it, postpone it, and then have Manny out until January, and that would be, you know, January, February would be for sure the earliest Spence can fight. So, but one thing that I like to do here on the show is wait until the shit pops off in the ring. And one thing I talked about last week is they're probably going to need about three out of these four fights to pop off. So people feel like they got their entertainment value. Without Spence there, you think Pacquiao Ugas 
sure sounds like a lot like Mayweather Birdo or Mayweather Guerrero or Pacquiao Algeri or Pacquiao Rios. You know, it's like, I, I don't know, man. You just don't know. Ugas, I mean, I thought he was a live dog. I put some money on him. I did pick Manny by decision. Thought he'd win, you know, seven, eight rounds. Um, I just, I got to admit, I didn't see Ugas, you know, going into it. I didn't think he could get the seven or eight rounds where he won him clean. And I think you need at least seven, eight rounds clean to get a decision. That was another thing. It was great that we got ourselves a good decision. and There was no bullshit draw or anything like that. But going back to in the ring, that's like, you know, that's why we always wait to fully critique it and, and not sit there and say, oh, they got lucky with this. Oh, they got lucky with that. Now, you know, the co-feature, that is a weak co-feature, but, you know, it is what it is. You know, they did have a fight fall off. Ugas's opponent did get COVID, I believe, right? So that got bumped up. So that wasn't the – not like the Ugas opponent was, you know, a great co-feature either. But um, the card itself had action fights. And basically the matchmaking was like that fun TV matchmaking. Like a TV fight is what a lot of you people used to call it. And we got like – Three out of four, and to be honest with you, the first chunk of rounds of Ortiz and Guerrero were actually better than I thought it would be. I really thought we'd get more of the second half of the fight, where it was a little sloppy. There were some moments of back and forth, but it'd be sloppy. They'd be a little slower, yada, yada, yada. I did appreciate the fact that they were both washed. We talked about that as well. But the matchmaking paid off, and I really don't know anyone or seen anyone say they didn't get their money's worth. That was a solid, solid pay-per-view, a fun, fun night. I mean, that magseo uh, Seha fight, that's probably a top 15 fight of the year, in my mind anyway. You had both guys on the mat, both guys slugging it out, and then you had a, a highlight real knockout. I, I mean, that kind of qualifies for a top 10 top 15 fight of the year so anytime you got that and then you had what was still a competitive fun fight it just kind of slowly in the main event i'm speaking kind of slowly but surely fell off the opener was good and like i said i kind of thought it would take a couple rounds maybe even four to six well it was only a 10 rounder for uh ortiz and guerrero but you know i I thought it'd take some rounds for them to get their rust off it was kind of funny they kind of shot their load paused um, early in the fight, and then it kind of looked sloppy. But, um, you know, if that's the worst fight of the card, which it was, it wasn't even a bad fight. Now, though, you know, it left a bad taste in your mouth, right, because of the last few rounds. But other than that, that was a really, really entertaining card and 100% got my money's worth. And that's why, that's why you know, we can – Give our take on what we think is a good matchup. Of course, we can preview and predict it. We can talk about a variety of things, but we're not, as much as people think, you know, they are on boxing Twitter, we're not professional matchmakers. Some of us come up with great ideas for matchmaking, right? But if you're not getting paid, if that's not like one of your, you know, either your full income or partial income, then it's easy to sit back you know, Monday morning and say, oh, that sucked, or oh, this sucks. Um, you got to see in the ring, and then it actually counts. So we're going to start the show by preview and predict, or preview and predict, recapping, of course, Pacquiao Ugas, but the rest of the undercard, which, like I said, excuse me, was really, really, really fun to watch, man. Um, we'll also take a look, um, you know, at this weekend's fight. Uh, Jake Paul and uh, Tyron Woodley. Can Woodley stop this uh, Jake Paul train? Whether it's hype train or not, it's a train. And it's coming to a town near you, like it or not. I understand some purists or hardcores, you know, hate it. I get that. But uh, you got to at least give him credit for this matchup. Um, because here's a guy that has fought in a lot. Um, I know it's MMA, but... You know, the dude is known to have some power. He's also known for, like, a jump punch, you know, leaping into his punches. We'll see. I also saw him do a little shoulder roll. I was like, oh, don't you dare pull the Andre Berto and break out the shoulder roll in your first boxing match, uh, Woodley. 
Uh, I hope you don't do that, but we will talk about that. Um, and then, you know, obviously now it seems that Canelo plant is back on. It is a done deal for November 6th. We now have that official. We're assuming it's going to be on Fox. Um, and then, you know, of course, some current fight news that we'll talk about. Uh, the WBC was busy, um, you know, making some mandatories. We got some news for um, for Crawford and Porter. They're, it looks like they're going to live stream the bid, which is kind of funky, but whatever. Yeah, yeah, that works for me. I think that's going to be like a week and change uh, from now. So, um, so yeah, and obviously, you know, we like to show end the show on uh, fight news and, and, and the boxing Twitter segment where we read like the tweets of the week, right? But we also kind of break down, you know, these fanboys out here on boxing Twitter, especially some of these media members that act like fanboys. We got to read those tweets too because it's funny. But then also Matchroom USA slash the zone, you know, what's up with their schedule? Um, especially Matchroom USA, Eddie Hearn. Their last event was in May. Haney Linares. Um, wow. <laughs> so now that they have no Canelo purse, you know, it, it sounds like the budget's going to be lower now, which you'd assume it'd be lower, right? But you got more money on the table to spend on other fights because you don't have that super large guarantee but if this is if this is what matchroom usa is coming down to where we get a good schedule of canelo fights on their network or on their you know platform and if he doesn't we got something mediocre it's it's just funky i mean literally matchroom usa like we've already gone down the fox rabbit hole right we've already done that but let's not just leave matchroom usa out of this because eddie hearn was going to take over the world a couple of years ago and now he's taken over the the world the zone wise outside the world in the uk that that was something that you know we saw happening but imagine if top rank or even more obviously al Heyman and the pbc hadn't scheduled something since may 29th what do you think the media and boxing twitter would be doing then well first of all they'd be loving it but you know what i mean like that's crazy and we've heard, you know, Pro Gray uh, Garcia is not going to happen. Maybe it'll happen next, but they may take tune-ups. We're hearing this. We're hearing that. It, it, it's just funky. Like, where is Matchroom USA? And it's not just on Eddie Hearn. Because we know DeZone owns a good chunk of Matchroom USA. So it's not just Eddie. But right now, Golden Boy or Eddie has nothing on the schedule. It, it, it's nuts. I get it for scheduling purposes. Like, well, what dates do we have? Because we got to get Canelo figured out first. I get that, but you can put your ducks in a row and then release something. You know, you all this time you could have been, you know, putting your ducks in a row. A lot of times with Al, he doesn't say anything. All of a sudden they release a schedule. You'll get a leak here, leak there, but then they'll just release him and Showtime. Fox did that a couple of years too. But it's a head-scratcher, to say the least. So we will be getting to that stuff. Like I said, we'll start with recap. Um, But if this is your first time listening to the Rope It Up Radio podcast, welcome. It streams live right here on blogtalkradio.com forward slash Rope It Up Radio. You don't have to go to Blog Talk and Rope It Up and download the show directly there if you don't want to or or listen to the browser. You can find the platform um, at Apple Podcast, iHeartRadio, Player FM, TuneIn, Stitcher, Spricker, almost across the board. We're also part of the Grueling True Sports Podcast Network, which can be found in a whole lot of places. While you're at it, why don't you head on over to thegruelingtruth.com. And one more thing, if you're thinking about cutting the cord or you have, you're not quite happy, I got something for you. It's called AT&T TV. And by the way, that's going to be direct TV stream here in literally a matter of days. The plan start as low as sixty nine ninety nine a month. Simple pricing, no hidden fees, no annual contract. You can stream it anywhere on any device. The cloud DVR is available. And if you sign up now for the choice package and above, you get a free year of HBO Max. That's AT&T TV. Like I said, I, I believe it's going to be called Direct TV Stream, if I wrote that down correctly. Okay, so... Like I said, the father time is undefeated. We know all that. 
um, you can't really take away what Ugas did in the fight, though, because after all, you know, we knew Pacquiao, like I mentioned earlier, was out for over two years, right? And it's very difficult to come back from two years in general. Look at uh, Keith Thurman. Everything was going pretty good against Jose Cito Lopez. He got caught. He got caught again. Didn't really look good in that fight. And looked pretty good against Pacquiao. Pretty damn good. That spot's really good. But, you know, left uh, left some meat on the bones to the extent of just being sharp. He did go in there with an injury. Whatever's clever. But you just can't take a whole lot away from Ugas's performance. Because, like, it wasn't like you could just – you know, blow, you know, huff and puff and blow Manny down. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't like he was done, done. As the fight went on, you could see he was closer to done, done, right? But, you know, I actually gave him the first round because, you know, I, when you look at it, Ugas was doing really good work, had that jab just pumping, right? Um, but then there was a, a like a right hook, a clean shot, and a few other um, you know shots beyond that. You know that something to me was like, whoa, um, dang, he hit him clean. Like, is is he good? Because for a second there, it did look like Pacquiao kind of stung Lugas a little bit. To me, he was back steady with that jab, and he started to add body work that early in the second round. Um, you know, in the first or in the second round a few nice shots, um, but Ugas was in control in the second round. So I did have it 1-1. I gave Pacquiao the third two, those short and quick combinations early, and then it got more action pack late. And that was another competitive round that could have went either way. I thought the jab um, was, you know, obviously a weapon that Ugas, you know, had the whole fight, but those roundhouse rights started landing pretty flush too. So that, that round could have went either way. I did give it to Pacquiao. I thought that was a great action fight, uh, or action round, I should say. In the fourth round, really, really strong warning from a low blow that was, I'm not going to say it was directly right on the belt line. It was on like the lower half of the belt line, and some people think that's not the belt line, whatever it is. Um, I still had Ugas winning that, that jab in more body work. That, I mean, between the jab that would land not just effectively and accurate, but hard enough to really fr- not just frustrate Manny and mess up his attack, but it, it, it would back him up at times. And it, he started to, you saw as that fight went on, he started to wait for that other shot, or not just wait, but react to a shot that hasn't even been thrown. Um, fifth round was very competitive, several extreme exchanges, especially down the stretch. And I thought this is where, you know, you had the rapid fire combinations, maybe a couple of those punches in the rapid uh, fire combo from Pacquiao. Maybe they landed a little bit harder, um, but the countering and the timing really by the fourth and fifth and sixth round, Ugas with the timing was on point. And like I said earlier, it's really difficult to get the last punch on Manny, um, especially in a rapid fire situation. And it was like he would just – he got to the point where he was leaned in on him, making it look like a, a better target than it really was. He would do a little step back. The jab, you know, obviously would help him there too. But he would kind of just cover up, but not earmuff mode, but just cover up enough. You know, he moved, moved around, of course, upper body movement, but the counter back – was really, really good. Um, But then, you know, could you give Pacquiao? So I gave him the the fifth round. Um, And then there's really beyond that, I mean, Ugas had the crisper shot, the defense, the counters, you know, and and he would counter and then attack off of it. Um, Could you give the seventh to to Manny? Maybe. I don't know. He did close well. he started getting his jab going a little bit more. I should give him credit for that. But really, after that, you know, I mean, maybe maybe seventh round. But really, after the fifth, it was tough to give Pacquiao another round. The round started slowing down. The pace definitely favored Ugas. 
and the jab right hands. You know, he actually didn't use the jab down the stretch as much, but he kind of had the rhythm by that time, you know, um, and those looping right hands kept finding a home. And even in the 11th and especially the 12th, there was times where he was kind of trashing them. I should say thrashing them with that right hand early and often. Uh, Pacquiao came back with a little noteworthy, you know, flurry, but not, not enough, not enough at all. And like I said, it was nice that they got the scorecards uh, right. It, you know, I had it, I had it right in the eight to four range, maybe seven to five. Uh, I know people don't like this, maybe seven, four, one, something like that. Um, but uh, obviously someone had it seven to five. And then the other two had it one sixteen, one twelve. So eight to four. So that, that was something I look forward to. Like just, I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy that Pacquiao was able to throw 815 punches at this age, but when you're only let, you know, land in 16% and your overall punches for Ugas, not the power shots, but the overall punch accuracy, 37% at a, at a high level, let's say a top level. Yeah. This isn't prime Pacquiao. When was he in his prime? Like, let's not even bring that up. We all know he hasn't been in his prime for a long time, but when you land 37% of your regular, just all your shots, your overall, that's that's crazy. 151, 405 was the, uh, the totals there. Um, like I said, it wasn't just a matter of huffing and puffing and then Manny would just go away. There's plenty of times he made little short rallies. Right, he is used to kind of stunning someone and turning the round around, and then winning it just off of whether they're landing or not. It is quick combos and, and some stuff that makes you react. And we saw that, like I said, in the opening five rounds, there were moments where Pacquiao, I'm not going to say hurt, a borderline buzzed, right? But but woke his ass up, Ugas, you know. And it was like, ooh man, this is where we're going to find out if Ugas can handle this stuff. And he put on, my, my point is, it wasn't just Manny Bazol. And anybody that says that is just a Manny fanboy or maybe anti-PBC, I don't know. But Ugas put on his best performance or right there, up there, in my mind, with his best performance. I mean, it was just so complete. And he just got so comfortable. And once that pace slowed down, he controlled most of the round. Very, very, very impressive. So, you know, and here we are. Ugas, you know. Now, of course, like, as far as popularity and making fights big, this Ugas fight makes all Ugas fights bigger now. This Ugas Pacquiao fight. Now, of course, being selfish or thinking of boxing as a whole, sure, Spence getting a win here would mean more. And it would it would put him in the same sentence with Manny for that week or whatever. You know what I mean? Not not the same sentence as an overall, you know, career. But anytime you line it up and you got a full week and, and, and people are hearing about it, whether they see it or not, they saw the highlights. Clearly he you know, I, I, he probably would have won, right? So Crawford or Spence getting a win over Pacquiao, it would mean more and it would help that fight. However, the fact that – and I mean help it – not just help it get made, but it would help, you know, the popularity. It just would. But now with Ugas, who is pretty fresh for, a, what, a 34-year-old? He's fairly fresh. He doesn't get in a lot of wars. And let's be honest. It's not like – there's still Thurman. He could have a rematch with Porter. Obviously Spence. If Cropper comes over the PBC, like it's, he's got, not to mention the guys coming up beyond that, he, he's got a bunch of fights in front of him, whether he wins or loses. And who knows how long Spence is going to be out. A lot of people are just kind of throwing out six months. I, I have no clue. I have no clue. So it, it's like as far as this round robin stuff, at the 47-pound division, it really helps that in general. Because we all know Porter and Ugas would be a great fight, too, because that there's some unfinished business, in my mind, in that fight. So, yeah. And it does – this makes for a legit WBA 
uh, super title or whatever. This is a legit belt now, right? You, 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 we can at least call it there. Now they just got to figure out the rest of the trash at the <laughs> at the division and clean that up. But that that's another subject. Um, real quick, I'm gonna get to John in just a moment. Uh, Carlos Castro and Oscar Escandon put on um, a pretty damn good fight too, dude. That was fun. Um, you did start to see, you know, uh, Castro really kind of calm down a little bit. I thought it was a very competitive fight. I had it 2-2 after the first four with Escondano winning the first and the second. His aggressiveness from the gate looked like he buzzed Castro um, with, a, I think it was a late left hook in the last, I think it was like literally the seconds before the end of the round with the left hook. Definitely hurt him. Uh, but you can start to see the reach, the movement behind the solid jab um, of Carlos. And once, you know, I'd say fifth, sixth round, there was back and forth, don't get me wrong, Castro would just kind of nick the round, you know what I mean? Um, the seventh round, there was an early knockdown. I think it was an uppercut. There was a jab uppercut or something like that. Um, the jab right hand in the uppercut from Castro was pretty damn impressive. Um, but yeah, it was hard to give Escandon much after that, those first four or five rounds. Um, and even the jab through seven rounds was 55 to 13. Um, and, you know, come around to the, uh, 10th round, it was a right hand, um, right on the ear that hurt Escandon, uh, pretty early in the round. I think, let me see, uh, 45 seconds into the round. And then there was a flurry, like, off a of TKO, and he almost took a knee. So anybody saying, oh, they shouldn't, you know, Escondone was fine. Well, why'd you duck that? You know, why'd you go down again? It was really weird. It was like, well, you know, if you could, the last thing you're going to do when you're already up on your feet is go down again. You know, it doesn't, it's kind of like laying on a rope and, and bending over too far to where you're you're hiding so much of a target, there's no legal target anymore. Um, i.e. Molina um, in that fight his, one of his first biggest fights Molina was on the ropes and he was just screwed it was DeMarco right I think that was the fight and, and they stopped the fight some people complain but it's like dude you can't it's like Kovalev in that war fight you can't bend that far over where there's no target there's got to be at least some sort of target now obviously when you're you know, worried about your defense, you know, you know, you don't want a target, but there's got to be something that you can legally punch because you saw Ward looking like, all right, I guess I'll just punch him here. I don't, there's really no place to punch. Um, but then that Julio Seja and Maxeo, Maxeo, Mark Maxeo fight, that was fun. And it, it almost looked like it was going to be kind of one of those Seha's, you know, fights where he just kind of gets beat early. Uh, that left, left hook dropped him early. And there was a lot left. You're thinking, oh, boy. But Seha got up and, you know, did some good work after that. And I even gave him the second round after that. It was like he's got the pressure behind the jab. He's digging to the body. Third round was very close. Fourth round I gave to Seha it was back and forth. Um, you know, you had Max Sale kind of landing the flush, flashy combos. But the body work and the harder shots, I, I actually gave Seha – um, the fourth and the fifth round, multiple flur flurries by Seha to the body, especially. He definitely buzzed him. It was an uppercut knockdown, I think, that dropped him. And then you're like, all right, dude, here's a young fighter. Se you know, when Seha's this dangerous, you're in trouble. You never really, you know, it takes a couple rounds to see which Seha's showing up against, you know, who he's showing up against. But he was, you know, dare I say, dominating, you know, the fight, if you look at body work, I talked about jabs in the last fight. Through six rounds, it was 76 to 19 to the body. He was landing the better shots. Just pressure, pressure, pressure. The seventh round was a fun, fun action round. Eighth round, once again, you had uh, McSale have, you know, some success. But it seemed like he was getting outworked in the heavier punches when it happened with Seha. Ninth round, another closer round. I gave it to Max Sale, and I believe he was down on the cards, if, if I remember correctly. Um, but Max Sale came out, 
Landed some good combinations. A few seconds later, huge right hand put the lights out, knocked him out. I think it was a was it a second like he hit him with the right and then another one. That was like one of those moments where you're like your hope sales okay, of course, but that was impressive. And like I said, whether you think that's a top fifteen, top ten, that had the ingredients of like a fight of the year type stuff, both on the mat, like I mentioned. And uh it was fun. It was a it was a great card overall. And like I said in the opening, you know, I like to judge it in the ring too. That we can't just all act like we're professional ma- matchmakers on boxing Twitter, right? We gotta, we could think that we a, a matchup's good, and sometimes you put up a great fight and it doesn't turn out that way, and, and you, then you can't really blame the matchmakers either because it's like, well, everybody was cool with that fight, and, and, and then all of a sudden it didn't turn out, or maybe one sided, more one sided, just maybe not an action packed fight, right? Um, I mean, look at Rigando and. Casemiro, right, a week ago. So that was a fun card, though. Definitely got my money's worth, and that's the key. Did you get the entertainment value? And I would definitely say yes on that one. Uh, Valenzuela looked good uh, in that TKO on the undercard. A couple other, uh, you know, fights that we'll talk about, the Ortiz-Guerrero. Like I said, I didn't think it would start that good. I thought it would take a good two, three, four rounds for them to warm up. But they didn't they didn't need much warm up. They were they were ready to go. The problem was the second half of the fight, that's where it actually ended up getting pretty ugly. <laughs> that's where it ended up getting pretty ugly. Anyway, um like I said, we will be uh talking about a variety of stuff. We're gonna go ahead and bring in a great boxing mind, John, to the fold and see what he thought about Saturday's uh, card from top to bottom. What's going on, John? How you doing, man? Hey, Chris. Good to be here. Just enjoying listening to your recap and ready to uh, give some of my own thoughts on last Saturday night. Yeah, it was, uh, you know, what a performance by Ugas. We'll start at the top and then we'll, you know, go to Maxeo, Seha, and whatnot. But, uh, you know, like I mentioned, it wasn't like all you had to do was just kind of, you know, like Manny was just done done or something like that. Sure, down the stretch of the fight, he looked worn out. He didn't look great. He wasn't sharp. But that's what happens when you're out of the ring so so long anyway. But I really thought Ugas put on a great performance and there's really not many fights that I've seen in his career because I thought that performance was better than the Porter performance had he thrown that right hand more during Porter that Porter fight and and done some of it now Porter gave him a different you know look that fight don't get me wrong but it was nice that it wasn't just an old guy that looked really bad or anything like that because Manny didn't look bad at the start of the fight. I really thought Ugas put on a hell of a display there. Yeah, Chris, this is one that, you know, you don't always get it right, but this is one I felt like I had right. Um, And a lot of it was because of what you've already alluded to, which is, you know, seeing some of the afterthoughts on Twitter and, even some of the before thoughts, I I think they were underestimating Ugas going into this fight. And it, it seemed like there were people that just didn't want to accept that. I mean, we knew going in Pacquiao was coming off a two year layoff and he was 42 years old. You know, of course he's going to show some deterioration and really you'd have to be a fool to not take that into account. Um, So, you know, that was already out there and, you know, and I think people, they also made a mistake thinking you're automatically going to get the Pacquiao that was in against Thurman. And remember, Thur- you know, Thurman was a little bit deteriorated going into that fight. Pacquiao fought extremely well, taking nothing away. Um, and he scored legitimate knockdown and hurt him another time to the body. But I think for myself, viewing that fight, I do think Pacquiao legitimately edged out that fight, but I think if it weren't for those moments, you know, it's it's a fight that could have gone the other way. So you got to keep that in the back of your mind too. You know, it was a tight fight, even though Pacquiao performed well. And then I think people just underestimated Ugas. I agree with you. 
uh, that, you know, to me, I, you know, because I, I like what Ugas kind of coincided with that. You know, I liked a lot of what PBC was trying to get going, uh, you know, especially in their early years. And uh, Ugas was definitely a part of that, you know, making a lot of regular TV appearances early on, you know, and really got on that amazing role starting on the Jamal James with the Jamal James one, you know, the Minnesota guy, of course, uh, that you're very familiar with, you know, given James his first loss, uh, and, and even before he laid off the two years, he had the loss to Imam, who was a good prospect at the time, but his, his other two losses were, were by split decision. So, you know, it, it just seemed to me that, that a lot of, you know, and then Ugas had been training for a fight on that card. So, you know, it, it might have been a different story if he was just called in and you had to guess what kind of shape he was in. But this was the case where you didn't have to do that. I mean, he was supposed to fight on that card. You know, he's going to f- fight Fabian Maidana, who ended up also getting injured, and uh, he didn't fight on that card just as Errol Spence did. And so he was so he was ready. So I think if you knew enough about Ugas and had followed his career, you should have known this was going to be tough for Pacquiao. I also saw people. You know, I, I, it seems you agree with me here, Chris. I thought this was a little bit of a just odd take on it. Um, again, because I think it's, it's people not valuing Ugas properly. You know, they uh, they were saying, oh, well, you know, Prime Pacquiao would have just, you know, handled Ugas, and this would have been just like a Josh, Joshua Clotty, the Joshua Clotty right. fight for Pacquiao. No, you know, Joshua Clotty does not have near the skill level that, that Ugas has, he didn't have near that skill skill level. Ugas was a decorated amateur, you know, with the Cuban national team and an Olympic medalist. It's not Joshua. It's not Joshua Clotty. So the point is, would a prime Pacquiao, and I, and I saw some other newspaper takes like that today. I mean, would a prime Pacquiao uh, at his very best at welterweight have beaten Ugas? Yeah, sure he could have, but I think Ugas at his best, and he's 35, he's even maybe a hair past his best, even though he performed extremely well, he, he's always going to be a problem. You know, he's one of those kind of guys. So, you know, he, he brought that kind of level into this fight already. So I just think there was a lot of underestimating of him. He definitely won the fight. I agree with you too. The, the Porter fight was the biggest fight of his career before this one. But, but I'm with you, you know, having really watched a lot of this guy's career and when he made this grinding you know, methodical comeback that, that he worked his way back up to the top of the boxing world. I don't think the Porter fight was one of his good performances. He was, even though Sean Porter's tough, he was more tentative than he had been in this great comeback he's had uh, from the two-year layoff. And, and I don't think that was one of his best performances, even though it was a split decision. A lot of people thought he won, but that's how skilled he is. Uh, I just, I thought just, just what you said, I, I thought if he would have had the act, the, level of throwing punches with authority uh, and, and selective aggression like he had against Pacquiao or in some of his other big wins like, you know, against Perella, against, you know, James, he knocked out Ray Robinson. You know, I think he, that would have made the difference against Sean Porter. So, uh, and, you know, Ugas came off a good win against Abel Ramos, who's been a guy that's been performing well in recent years himself. So I, I think, uh, solid one for Ugas. I think people underestimated him going in and he performed like he, like he's capable of. Uh, I think Pacquiao probably goes on from here. I, I think what I, we're also not hearing enough talk about is look, you know, Pacquiao might've done a lot of good things for a lot of people and given away money and things like this. But I got to say again, Chris, another take that's getting a little bizarre and, and you know, Pacquiao's at all time. Great. No doubt about it. Great fighter. As we said last week, he and Mayweather really became, you know, as, as boxing was kind of fading more, you know, the two breakout stars who crossed over to casual fans. But, you know, this idea that Pacquiao is not fighting because he needs money and he just wants to, you know, I have people, there's people out there tweeting and saying, like, he he can fight again to just give money away. Pacquiao, Pacquiao's not, I right. got a good guess, Pacquiao's not fighting just to give money away. Maybe Pacquiao's fighting because he needs money. I mean, these guys are boxers. They're not sophisticated financial guys. No matter what their advisors are, they got to pay trainers. They got to pay management. They get taxed. You know, you've already heard a lot about Pacquiao. And this is, you know, 
through boxers throughout history, you know, heck, Joe Lewis. You know, the, it's, it's hard. They're like their own business. And when you don't set aside the right money for taxes with the kind of money guys like, frankly, Floyd Mayweather, too. You know, Floyd Mayweather and Manny Pacquiao have made, and you're living a lifestyle at the same time. All of a sudden, there there could be a big tax bill due or some other kind of bill due. And we know the only way these sure. guys know to make money throughout the is to box. So, you know, again, let, let's face it, even though it, it became a – he made it a heartwarming story, but – George Foreman came off the ten-year layoff because he didn't have a he didn't have any money, um, you know. So I, I don't. I got a feeling, even though maybe we think we should have, and it won't be to give money away. That Pacquiao probably, I figure. I said it last week. You know, he was in a situation. The the, the Spence payday obviously was going to be a big one. Spence, a, a, an up and coming potential star or superstar. And Pacquiao had already been at that level, obviously, with the Floyd Mayweather pay-per-view, among others. And, uh, you know, their change to Ugas. I mean, I got to say this, that Pacquiao's defense probably went through with it for money, not for the love of the sport, is, you know, it switched to Ugas, a tricky guy. You know, he's not more difficult than Errol Spence. Right. But normally, you're in that situation. You know, if, if I'm Manny Pacquiao and I'm 42 and I'm his team, I'm saying, I don't want this guy. You know, you give me somebody right. else, but I, but I figure he was ready, and I think he was in a situation. Obviously, he hasn't been paid for two years because the Keith Thurman fight was two years ago. That he probably privately with his people was saying, "Hey, look, guys, I gotta get, I gotta get paid." You know, in August of of twenty twenty one. So I, right. I'm, I'm going forward with this thing, and that's that's kind yeah, of my take on the main in, event there. Right, and it's not as intense. Um, uh, being a politician, you know, running for office as it is here financially, but that's not money too. That's not free to run for public. Obviously, like I said, it's not the same exact fundraiser stuff and, and you know, the, the, the bullshit we have here as far as you know, how we fund candidates and, you know, making it basically like legally corrupt type thing. But a lot of people just assume he's going to be president and I've talked about it here and there in the last year or so, just kind of doing minor research on that topic. And it's not like, like he's a popular guy and and maybe even, you know, a decade from now or two, you know, when he's older, he he will be president, but people just kind of assume he's going to be president. And it's funny. I looked into it a little bit. It doesn't look like he's, he may not even run. He hasn't even made the decision to run for president just yet, but, He's definitely like the the leader right now. If them two are not getting along like they used to, and he's talking about man, he's punch drunk and all this stuff. But here's another layer, and this was Ryan Singali or Singala. Um, he said, you know, we're going to hear a lot about Pacquiao presidential hopes tonight. Uh, important context to keep in mind is. He's polling in fifth place, and he's about 50 points behind the front runner in his home region. So before we just assume like we know who's going to win president in another country, you know, it's not just a done deal that they're just going to make him president. People love Manny, but, you know, they also probably want someone in there with experience. I mean, most things are better than the guy they got running the country now, obviously, but I guess how different will it be if he loses? But anyway, that's something to think about, too. And it doesn't sound like he's done. He's got enough popularity where, you know, they can say, hey, um, Australia, you know, is is willing to pay you five million. Or we talked about the U.K. They'll give you five million. They'll give you know, they're willing to obviously, you know, Saudi and some of the Middle East, they're willing to as a tourism department, say, hey, that is something we will invest in. And so I don't think he's done either. Um, but, uh, you know, we've seen this before, you know, and it doesn't look like Manny's done done as far as fighting in the ring. Um, and if he fought someone, even if he fought at 140 or something like that, I don't think he's done. And Ugas has, because on the, he kind of, besides Porter, he did kind of mop up a lot of, you know, that second layer 
of, of welterweight. So he does still have, obviously we all think the Spence fight, if Crawford were, were to become with, you know, with the BBC and Al Heyman, that's a big fight. And then, you know, Thurman, that's a big fight now all of a sudden. And by the way, we know what Keith Thurman's going to do when he's done boxing. Because I really like, what do you think about him as a commentator? I like his energy. Um, you know, I, I think he's really good at it, man. Oh, yeah, I think he's got a lot of potential there. Um, I think he's always had potential there. And I, I think, you know, just like most people in life, of course, if not all of us, as he does it more, he'll get better. But, yeah, I think he's got a, he's got a lot of potential there. I think he's, even though he's been off a lot, I, I got a feeling he's not done fighting yet either. Despite what we're hearing with the purse bid, with and I'm, I'm, I think it's relevant because they were both on the broadcast uh, Saturday night. And, you know, as UFC has started to do with fighters broadcasting, PBC has been doing as well, you know, using it as kind of extra promotion for these guys. You know, it was Porter and Thurman on there at the same time, and they've talked about them having a rematch. And whether people want to hear that or not, maybe some people do want to hear it. It just depends who you are. Uh, you know, WBO, Crawford, Porter, purse bed to me. I mean, people will take it, take that like that's going to control this thing. I mean, you know, I, I think, frankly, from both top rank and PBC's perspective, I mean, they're, you know when it gets to upper-level fighters, and I think and Crawford and Porter qualify in today's game, is that the WBO is not going to dictate who's going to get paid how much and where and when those guys are going to fight at, at that level of fighter. That's, that's just not right. going to happen. So I'll, I'll tell you that in advance of your September 2nd purse bid. Uh, that, that, that's my take on that. I mean, people are putting way, way too much stock in that because top, top ranking, it's, it's both of them, top rank and PBC are, are not letting the WBO control that. That's a, that's a joke. I mean, and let's face it, one of your, prime examples of that and and i agreed with the canelo camp in that when canelo was going to fight golovkin they weren't going to let that and they did not they did not yeah they were they not going to no. let the ubc purse bed determine negotiations for the first right. golovkin canelo fight i mean they said get out of here take you know take your take your belt yeah, take your belt yeah <laughs> yeah take we'll see you in another year you'll be begging us you'll be making franchise right. champions for me just you know so yeah. Yeah. And now the WB and the WBC kisses Canelo's, you know, hind end whenever they can now at this yep. point. So, you know, they were they were not offended they were not offended in the long run whatsoever. So it shows no. you what a joke it is. So I, I mean, people cool, cool your engines on the September second purse bid. If PBC and it's it's not just PBC, it's top rank too. I mean, top rank. Yeah. Kind of giving a lot of false leads on it but whatever they want to do with Crawford for at least the one fight they got left they've got something in mind and it may not be may not be Sean Porter um but yeah I think you know getting to what you're saying about the welters though you know of course and and this just can't be controlled it's really unfortunate but you know when you if 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 we don't know and, and we really don't know but if you take Errol Spence though out of the mix because of the eye injury let's hope that's not the case but but let's say I, I'm a little worried. If that does become the case, it's just right. not. I mean, the division. Or even for a year, deep. you know, even for a year, that's what I'm be a long time. The division's still the deepest, and you had Spence and Crawford at the top. You know, two top pound for pound guys in boxing, plus guys like you know Pacquiao, you know Thurman, and and now you got you know Ugas, you know uh, up there Porter you know, all these prospects. So I, I still, I'll, I'll still argue with anybody that's the best division from top to bottom, but even with that depth, just Spence being one of the top star guys and in everybody's pound for pound list, uh, I'm not crazy about pound for pound, but as an illustration of what everybody thinks of him universally as they should, I mean, to me, he's one of the best fighters in boxing without a doubt. And, you know, Crawford's right there too, but you with Spence, like you said, even if it's a year, uh, you know, it, it, it kind of, you know, then then you're kind of waiting because he might be back. You know, and and who do we we, we want to? If you're PBC, make, and look, all the promotions do it, so it's not just PBC. But you know, who then do we might want to lay back and have fight safer opponents 
in anticipation of Spence sure. and who do we still want to have a tough fight? Because you got to make some decent fights. I mean, in the meantime, that's, yeah. that's to me a big mystery. I, I actually don't know exactly how all that plays out. I, I, I think it's po- – I, actually, I, I will throw it out because – I've taken a lot of heat for it, but I'll stand by it because I do think it's going to be a big part of how it plays out. I don't think it would be with oh, yeah. Ugas because that would be a needless risk, but Tank Davis is going to be in that match. Right. I, I've, I've been saying it for months, and I think now with Errol Spence potentially on the shelf, it becomes even more imperative because then you can kind of almost fill that spot, even though Tank's on his way to becoming a star in his own right. But that then, you know, I don't think you would risk it wouldn't be risk reward for him to fight an Ugas at welterweight, but the other guys, you know, with the size matchups and things, I mean, he could, you know, he certainly could possibly fight Thurman. Uh, he could even take on, a, you know, Porter strong, but he doesn't have a lot of pop and he's not that tall. Um, you know, there, there's, 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 uh, there's, op- there's options there. You know, there's options there that, that of course top rank doesn't have with Crawford. So, um, I don't, I don't know exactly what, what top rank's going to, going to do with Crawford. I mean, well, obviously we're going to see, but I don't think this purse bed thing's necessarily determined. I think if PBC and top rank just want to make that Porter, uh, Crawford fight, then they'll just do it and they'll do it on their own. But, but I, I mean, I think that's what right. it comes down to. It's, it's not going to be WBO driven. I think that that's laughable. Yeah. And, you know, my guess is. They're going to um, – they obviously have to put up top rank just from the top rank perspective. They obviously have to put up enough money for the guarantee of, of, of Crawford. But also, you know, it has to be healthy enough for Porter to to want to make the fight too. And I think people lose sight of that. Well, whoever gets the – whoever wins the bid wins it. Uh, they got the fight. Well, no, no, because you can back out of it. <laughs> He, you know, Porter could back out of it, make more money fighting Thurman potentially. I know people don't want to hear that, but it, it, it's very true. It doesn't mean that that you're just locked and loaded. Uh, you can't. You have a. You you can bail out of it. You can say, nope, I'm done. You know, I don't want that. That doesn't suit me. Um, so we'll see how that goes. Now the undercard, Max Sale, Seha was a great, great fight, fun fight, action fight. Both guys hit the canvas. Let's talk a little bit about the undercard, which we said, you know, there, there needs to be about three out of four of these fights to uh, turn out, you know, to, to be action packed, to be interesting, to be entertaining for people to kind of have that entertainment value without Spence being on the card. And it really felt like it did. Let's talk about the undercard and start with uh, Maxeo and Seha. Yeah, I mean, you know, PBC has hit sometimes on some of these undercards that that really weren't good on paper and then the matchmaking was good and the fights turned out to be entertaining and this was one of those undercards but but they've had a lot of got to be fair they've had a lot of misses like that too it's it's still to me not a great way to do business you know when you're going hit or miss on these pay-per-view undercards or or even in some of the fox cards and that they've run you know they, they should be you know, with the exposure they're working towards with where they've got the Fox platform as an outlet FS one. Um, and, you know, this, and then when they're charging peak pay-per-views, you know, I, I think some of these undercards need to look a little, need to look better on paper going in and to be a little sure bet. But with that said, and this has happened before to their credit, this ended up being a, a uh, well-matched undercard, you know, say actually overall had been on a bit of a down streak, but, he showed a revived showed a revived version of himself against Figueroa, fought very well to that draw. But you know he, he was over the contracted weight. But but in this fight against Mike Sayo, he he fought well in this fight. And really, like you said, he was he was up on the cards. You know he got dropped early hard, but but stormed back and was up on the cards. And then you know ended up getting knocked out in a highlight fashion and apparently had to get taken to the hospital afterward luckily everything seems to be okay but real good fight like you said another another one of the the better fights of the year both guys hitting the canvas and you know frankly that's the type of excitement you're you're usually looking for in a fight of the year contender so um real real good fight i mean for me it's going to be hard 
for any fight this year to, you know, top the uh, top the Grant and Apoche war that thank goodness for boxing was on Fox. But uh, you know, this was a this was a good fight, and I think uh, for Magseo, which deservedly so, looks like you know, reporting from Transnational uh, as the rankings will be finished up for the week tomorrow. I, I think that he's probably going to just crack into the featherweight top 10. And that's to his credit because that's the real top 10. You know, if you want to look at transnational top 10 or, or ring, I mean, when we're talking about what I always refer to as the legit top 10, that's, that's really what you're looking at. You know, forget all the belts and alphabet ratings and things like that. So, you know, that's a, that's a big accomplishment for him to get to that level because, you know, people do look at that and, you're getting on the uh, radar screen for your, your, uh, your, your bigger matchups then. Um, and PBC has got a lot of guys at 122 pounds, only four pounds away, of course. And they still got Gary Russell, who, you know, to me is still the top featherweight in the world. He, he's around. So, you know, good, good spot for him to be in. And, and that is taking advantage of your spot on a pay-per-view card there being in a good entertaining fight and, and coming out with a highlight reel knockout win and and he's a Pacquiao associate promoted guy so you know Pacquiao had talked about that when he first went over to PBC and uh you know it has fought that has been followed through on so you have to think that that is part of it that you know he he liked that he had these fighters you know from the Philippines that were were under his wing and and uh he was going to be working with PBC with these guys and that has happened and this is one of those guys so uh, at least for Pacquiao on that front, that's also uh, paid off here. Yeah, that's a good call. And the way when he was watching this fight, I saw him kind of intensely looking at the fight, and I thought, man, you know, you don't want to get too emotionally wrapped up in this fight when you're back there trying to focus on your own fight. Um, but yeah, he did obviously. Ortiz and Guerrero had, like, a chunk of rounds that were really, really fun. And then it kind of just fell flat on it, flat on its face and got really sloppy after that. Uh, what would you think of Carlos Castro against Oscar Escondón in that fight? Yeah, get to that one second, Chris. I'll just throw in two cents on Ortiz and Guerrero. Um, you know, kind of a – you know, Ortiz has just surprised me a little bit because it had gotten so low – um, you know, kind of a little, I mean, the way it's going, he'll probably still go on, but, but kind of an epitaph for a career, you know, we never like to see, you know, anybody quit in boxing, but, you know, you know, he, he was really, of course, uh, you know, a, a real up and up and coming guy. One of the, you know, potential new stars in the sport had that absolutely entertaining war with Maidana and, you know, he was taking a lot of punishment in that fight when he quit. He took a lot of heat for it. But even though you don't like to see it, that was almost kind of, you know, you know, acceptable in terms of it was a, just a, even though Maidana was taking, of course, as much or more, you know, but brutal fight, Ortiz quit and that kind of acknowledged it. Always took a lot of heat after that. I, I thought at that point it almost was, was too much and a little undeserved, but then, he had he had these like non effort type fights, you know, like against against Colazzo, the the Birdo, you know, the Birdo rematch. Uh, you know, he, he he was having those fights like that, and and then he, what I'm getting to is he actually tried harder against Alexander, and then in this fight, but it's that sad thing where it's too you know it's too late now, you know, because Guerrero's done too, and and he lost to Guerrero and. Guerrero never had that problem, but, you know, he was coming off getting blown out by Figueroa. So two guys that I thought maybe at this point couldn't, couldn't provide the entertainment, but since Ortiz has put in a little better efforts here when it's really too late for him, uh, it's been able to do that. But uh, I don't don't know, you know, where these two guys go from here. I I guess Guerrero getting the win, he'll just end up being a PBC. He's got so many welterweights. I mean, it would be ugly, but, you know, they can throw him in with, with one of their more up-and-coming welterweights now, and, and Ortiz would just be on some undercard somewhere playing out the string, I guess. But Escondon and Castro, you know, Castro, a lot of people do like him uh, that followed the sport closely. Um, good win for him. Escondon is a guy that always uh, gives a good effort and uh, 
you know, he's had some he's had some good efforts where he's provided some tough fights, even though he's getting older. Uh, provided some upsets, and the guys that were able to handle him easily, uh, you know, Figueroa was uh, Tug Russell, but those are those are tough guys, you know, tough guys really at the top. So got to give even though it's going to be nearing the end of the line if it's not there got to give Escandone some credit but Castro's an up-and-comer that uh, a lot of people do like and, and have their eye on so again like uh, Maxayo this was a good spot for him to get a impressive win in front of this pay-per-view audience so there were some fighters that uh, took advantage of their opportunity Saturday night yeah, and it is nice, uh, you know, to get your money's worth. So we'll see, uh, you know, what – obviously we don't really have to worry about um, – well, I shouldn't say it's the next pay-per-view because technically that Tia Fimo and Camposis is still a, a discounted pay-per-view, you know, technically speaking, right? But we don't have to worry about that with the Wilder Fury trilogy undercard because that undercard – not only does it fit the heavyweight theme because it's all heavyweights, the fights themselves, especially, you know, the two other ones, uh, I mean, it's, I, yeah, we've already talked about that. We'll talk about that in the future. Now, that is an undercard where you're like, yes, that's what we need. That is a great, you got a main event that's legit, and then the undercard is very legit uh, as far as, like, prospect against prospect, a, a rematch from a fun fight, you know, showing off a, uh, Jared Anderson, so I'm really excited about that. Okay, so here we are. Jake Paul versus Tyron Woodley. You know, Paul, you know, fought like actually an amateur fight with some headgear. Then he fought some YouTuber that had no hope at all. Uh, then obviously he fought, you know, uh, an MMA guy last time who definitely is not on the same level as Woodley, especially when it comes to throwing punches and hurting people with punches. Clearly, Woodley has fought for a while. Different, you know, MMA, obviously different. I was saying earlier, uh, John, I saw him in this video because, you know, he was taking some pointers and in the gym uh, with Mayweather, and I saw him doing the shoulder roll, and I thought, oh, here we go. You are not going to have your first boxing match and in the same breath bring out the shoulder roll. We've seen many of fighters, Birdo. We actually saw um, Canelo do it uh, for a little bit, too, against uh, uh, it was that split site fight. I can't remember. It was one of the contender uh, guys. God, I can't remember. But he did the shoulder roll for a little bit. Every once in a while, we'll see a prospect do it. And it's like, dude. Not now. You you know, Floyd's been doing that since he was five. Like, don't do not do that. So hopefully we don't get too much of that. Woodley, you know, it is different watching the last guy and Woodley just watching their MMA because Woodley does look to throw punches. Obviously, he had a background in wrestling, but, you know, he looks to throw some punches where the last guy, you were just like Askren. It was really hard to even gauge anything out of him because he wasn't, you know, his style wasn't to throw punches. Um, at least Woodley, you know, has some power, no doubt about it, especially being a professional fighter this long at a high level. The jump punch, two things that stand out to me, the jump punch, because he jumps, you know, that Superman punch that just got famous in the UFC when, you know, boxing, we think that's a joke, uh, because obviously once you're leaving your feet, you, you're not, unless you're running from like, like it's a long jump. You know, and you're you got such a run up, and then you can jump and or like jump off a curb and hit someone or something like that. Sure, that would be effective. But if you're only getting a step or two and you're just leaping in the air, that that's totally taking away your power. Um, so that stands out. And then, like I said, him messing with his stance, which he, he did have to do. Woodley, he had to, you got to do something about your stance when you're an MMA guy if you're going to box. But same with McGregor, we saw that. But at least he boxed when he was a youth. That's, if he brings out the jump punch and the shoulder roll, I don't like his chances in this one. But what do you think? Now, Jake Paul's been at it almost four years now, something like that, as far as training in and out of camp, in and out of camp. You can see that he does return to camp um, fairly early because so much of his life is online that you, you know he's not out there partying for 
you know, four to six months and then get back. You can see he's taking it serious. You can see, I saw this from the first fight I saw with my nephews that he could straight punch. I remember the KSI and, and Logan Paul fight, which was headgear and all that. They wanted me to watch it to decide who who won. But the thing that stood out to me, John, was Jake Paul on the undercut. I said, yeah, I don't know about these other two, but Jake Paul can, you know, straight punch. How do you, what do you, what do you think here? Because to me, this is a legitimate step up for where his level is. Yeah, I think, I mean, you always, to me, you, you got the, the odds makers money on the line. So, some people always have trouble getting that through their head, but you start there. You have, you have, when, especially when you have a mystery type fight like this, as you're pointing out correctly. So Jake Paul is a slight favorite. Now, I, I think speak for the, the odds makers logic on this, what they're, what they're looking at. And this is the way I break it down. And this has helped me because this is one yeah, where it gets close. I think, I think this is what they're looking at. You throw out the, the one KO over the YouTuber because that, that doesn't really reflect anything, okay? But then you get to – he knocked out Nate Robinson, and, you know, he, he wasn't, a, he wasn't a, actually like a significant favorite in that fight going in. Now, we know Nate Robinson didn't have boxing experience, but again, let's look at what we did know at that point. I mean, this is just plain old fact. Nate Robinson had athletic ability where he played – you know, football a contact sport, so you got to keep that in mind. His defensive back and basketball at the University of Washington. Now, I know, hey, I love basketball, but when people talk about well, basketball really is a con. Basketball is not a contact sport, okay? So, but I'm saying he was a football player at the University of Washington. In addition to being a basketball player at Washington and an NBA player, so there's no disputing uh, that he had a. You know, Jake Paul has some high school athletic background, but it, it's not on the level of a Nate Robinson, okay? And and, and why you, you look at that, especially, too, even in fighting, is this is where the UFC was a good example of that, not in boxing, but the UFC and MMA because it was newer sports. When you saw Division One wrestlers started coming into that, like, like look when, when Brock Lesnar had been in WWE, not competitive fighting for years, but he was a top, top wrestler at the University of Minnesota. Again, you know, Chris, you're a Minnesota guy, so you know that stuff. Oh, yeah. I mean, Lesnar came back and won, you know, Lesnar came in and won fights and stood out for the sport. I mean, it wasn't for that long, but he did it. He was able to do it. So, you know, you, you saw, and you saw that with other Division One wrestlers in, in MMA and the UFC. So why I'm pointing that out is these were guys that had athletic ability, it, it's very difficult, you know, to be a legit Division One recruit at the high level in any sport. And in wrestling, when you had those guys start to come into MMA, and look at even a guy like Dan Henderson who wrestled at Ohio State, you know, Randy Couture, Oklahoma State. These guys, you know, they even started to be able to punch and stuff. So your next fight, then you have Askren. See, Askren was not a stand-up guy like you said, but Askren did have that, you know, he's got a Division One wrestling pedigree. So I think then, you know, you're not like, you're like, whoa, hey, this, you know, maybe Aspen wasn't stand-up, but, you know, he, he did have some time in the UFC, was at the top of Bellator, and, you know, Jake Paul just blew this guy out. But, you know, he also had the age advantages over Robinson and Aspen. So, but I think then you're looking at and you're saying correctly, like you were pointing out, you know, if Jake Paul is beating guys they are older than him, but they were division one athletes. And one was a division one wrestler who even was in a combat sport. Then he must be working on the boxing enough that he developed some boxing ability. So that's what brings me to this week's fight with Woodley because Tyron Woodley is a legit guy at Missouri who was at the top of the wrestling world. You know, he, he, he was winning in strike force. I remember that's when Showtime had strike force and he did so well you know, came over to the UFC and did very well there. Now he's 39 years old. So Clown is actually similar to Askren's. He, you know, he's better than Askren in MMA, you know, same type of wrestling background. So he's 39 years old. So then you're, you know, you're kind of in the same analysis where it ha- has Jake Paul's boxing development so superior. And then with an age advantage, to be able to do the same thing to Woodley 
that he basically did to ask for. And even though Robinson wasn't a fighter, I do throw him in for his Division One background, you know, his Division One athletic background, because Jake Paul is taking on higher level athletes now. They're older than him, but they are higher level. And so far, he's passed the test. So that makes me lean towards him. That it's kind of like what you said, you know, in the four years, other people are saying it looks like. You know, he's got an age advantage, and he has, you know, we've got to be fair to these guys who are taking him on. He has also put himself in a situation where you got to fight him at 190. He's given himself a little bit of a weight advantage because, you know, Askren and Woodley, you know, did a lot of their MMA work at 170 pounds. So he's given himself – he's been clever in giving himself a little bit of an age advantage, a, a little bit of a uh, weight advantage. And then, you know, it's – has he given himself enough boxing advantage, which so far the answer has been yes. And then it comes down to, will that be the case with Woodley? That's what it comes down to for me is with those other advantages he's got, does he still have enough of a boxing advantage over Woodley to beat him? I'm thinking probably yes, but could be, it could be a close call, but I, I think with all those advantages, Paul has been clever in giving himself. Uh, and he, he has looked pretty darn good. Let's face it. It's been entertaining. I think you've got to give him a little bit of an edge, and that's what the odds makers do, and that's probably how I would look at it at this point. But if Woodley's just a little bit of a better boxer with his background um, and, you know, Division One pedigree in wrestling, you know, that might be just enough to even it up, and, and, and it could, it could, be, could be entertaining because, you know, Jake Paul – hasn't had many fights still let's let's face it i mean it's only it's only a couple of fights right yeah that that is the the great unknown I, i'm glad though this time that they did step it up to a guy that a lot of shoot casual fans at both sides really or even hardcore fans in boxing would be like oh i've heard of that guy i know that guy and they definitely attacked each other online even before they were going to fight so um I, I just like how, you know, they, they, they've, it's a legit step up and for where he's at and, you know, pay pay-per-view if they want. If not, that's cool too. Obviously a lot of people are, you know, team stream or whatever, but um, it intrigues me. And, and I, I am picking Jake Paul uh, to win, but I, it's eight rounds, right? I think it's eight rounds. Yeah. I think it's I eight. don't know. Could, could, could this be the fight it goes the distance? I wonder, you know. Um, grappling skills on the inside, much like Logan Paul to Floyd Mayweather, that's not going to be as much of an advantage because of the sides are closer to one another. And, and obviously, as far as leverage and grappling, at least, you know, Jake did um, wrestle in high school, nowhere near on the level, like you were saying, uh, of Woodley and whatnot. But, um I don't know. I mean, I could see a TKO. I'm not sure about this, you know, this one punch stuff, one punch highlight stuff that he's been doing. Do you think it could go eight rounds or do you think that by the time we get to the fifth and sixth and seventh, both these guys might be just gassed? Paul so far seems to be looking for knockouts and I figure he'll continue to do that. So I, I'm not looking at it going the distance. Um, I'd say if it does, you know, you, you would think Paul could be a little trouble, but then as much endurance as wrestling and MMA takes, I mean, I actually thought myself, I, you know, I, but since it's this kind, these kind of fights, it is worth mentioning. Um, you know, I actually thought Conor McGregor did do better against Floyd Mayweather than, you know, a lot of people give him credit for. Uh, I don't think Floyd was carrying him. I don't think Floyd, would would take that risk you know why should he i think he was just being cautious just in case see what he was dealing with but why i'm alluding to that fight is everybody that saw it you know this part was also legit it, it, this was very interesting to me and a lot of other people uh who, who were watching it carefully um mcgregor started to get tired and, and in other words you knew he'd been in MMA, and, and there's no doubt MMA takes a lot of stamina, but I think the people that said this, this was right in the analysis, boxing, holding your arms up, you know, what you got to do, just different motions, took a different missing punches. Yep, missing punches, all that kind of stuff, and 
you know, since Jake Paul has been boxing, even, even though it's just been for a very short period of time, and we know Woodley from his wrestling background and how tough wrestling is and how tough MMA is and the stamina required, we know the guy's always been in shape and had stamina, but we know, you know, watching something like McGregor Mayweather that it might not be the same stamina, like you said, if it starts going around. So you don't – you don't know exact layout, which could be an interesting point. Uh, you know, if Jake Paul does take an early run at him and doesn't get him out of there, how does it play out? You know, is Woodley's experience and past conditioning uh, going to win out? Or is, like we're saying, you know, Jake, uh, Jake Paul having been doing some boxing, being the younger guy, is maybe Woodley doing motions he's not accustomed to? Uh, does he start gassing out and, and maybe get taken out later on? I mean, I, I do find this Jake Paul thing interesting. One thing that's changed a little for me, and you've mentioned it, is before we had the pay-per-view barrage, it seemed, um, I was kind of like, well, this will be discounted. I found this thing entertaining. Um, I, I think I'm probably on board for it. And, you know, I may get it either way, but I'm just saying from I like to talk about it from the fan value perspective first. You know, you, you made right. a good point, and I agree. I mean, to me, the Fury Wilder 3 is a throwback. I mean, that's what we want out of boxing. That's the kind of card we yeah. need. We want to support that. You want to, frankly, happily plunk your money down for that, and that's what we need. So to me, and to, to most hardcores and hopefully a lot of casuals, if they don't really exist, but if they come around for that card, everybody's on board for that. But, you know, we just had Pacquiao and Ugas, not even Pacquiao and Spence. Um, you've got Canelo and Plant, which is intriguing, but again, that's money. So, you know, now when you're looking at all this out there, um, and let's face it, it is all Fox, Showtime, PBC. You, you know, that's what they're going with right now. They've got the, the bigger yep. name fighters right now in general. So you gotta you got to be fair there. I mean, Canelo and Pacquiao are your two biggest names in the sport that are active. So, um, And then you've got Fury Wilder, the heavyweights. But, but it's, it is a lot, you know, that's a lot of, that's a lot of pay-per-view getting thrown at you. And then, you know, so you're looking at Jake and that's where you mentioned, I just saw that recently too, but smart. I mean, it shouldn't even be pay-per-view, but if Lopez Cambosis is going to be out there on Trilla for pay-per-view, yeah, 1999, maybe you get some people jumping back on board for that, even though it's not a great fight. I think Lopez blows him out, but maybe get some people right. back into it. I, I like the Jake Paul thing. It's just kind of an interesting story. And, and you know, let's face it, it's about entertainment. Is providing entertainment, um, so I like that. I like that. But but now you're you're landing in the midst of a lot of a lot of pay per views. But it, it's been entertaining. I mean, look, Stephen Espinosa, as we all know, is a very smart guy. He's no fool. Uh, when they picked up Jake Paul, they picked him up. They picked him up for a reason. I mean, these guys right. see numbers. You know, they they know numbers. Yeah. They've got inside information on that stuff, and you know, they don't waste their money. You know, if they can help it, they make mistakes like anybody else. But you know, Espinosa right. looked at it and said, "Let's get this. Let's get this guy on board with what we're trying to do." So, you know, he he's it see and and it seems he's been doing pretty well. Um, you know, I was I was also been watching stuff lately. We kind of know this, but again, it fits in with the Jake Paul. Um, you just hear it so much, even though it's kind of anecdotal. You have to take note. I mean, when you when you just when you just hear people in their teens and twenties talk, you know what what brings them in for the entertainment value or the characters they want right. to see? It, it's social media. I mean, they say social media. They just say it. It's just not what other generations grew up with. And and you know, like I'm taking it. I always take it seriously, but I'm taking it even more seriously. Like. They're talking like more than anything else, you know, not like in addition to say TV or, or, or something else. I mean, they're just saying social media. So, you know, that if, in other words, maybe for, for people that are a little bit older, you're maybe even now you're still not fully getting it that Jake Paul is a social media superstar. That means, you know, that right. means something. I mean, that that's like, you know, maybe for nowadays, in other words, what we're maybe not quite getting is that that's like a guy appearing on CBS TV 30 years ago and, and building his name. Right. Up. And, and uh, you know, you know, in other words, what I'm throwing that out for is who knows, maybe we're not looking at it the right way. Maybe Jake Paul on, on a Showtime platform's got the potential to do better numbers than a lot of a lot of other fighters out there. We know he does, but but maybe even, even right. some of the big names. 
Mm-hmm. That's a good point. Very good point. Anything else that you – oh, who, who are you going to pick? Are you going to pick Jake or are you going to pick uh, Woodley? I've been pretty much with with Jake on this one. Uh, I think it's kind of a tough call for the reasons we said, but I think I'm I'm assuming that's the logic with the odds, and that makes sense to me that I think I'm going with him because even though there can be differences in the individuals, he's he's kind of shown that with his youth size and how much he's boxed that he's going to have an ability advantage over – a top level athlete try to fight him. So uh sure. I it seems like that's the pattern here and we'll see where he goes next. Um but you know the way he's doing it there there's some room for him to probably get creative and think of some interesting opponents. So might might be interesting to to see where he goes next. But I, I think he probably gets by this one. And he looks for KOs so if I if I'm gonna pick him I got to think he's uh, he's he, that that right hand is is probably capable of uh, of scoring a scoring a KO over uh, over Woodley, but you know it's going to be it, it is it is an interesting matchup. I got to say, oh, as I thought when they signed it, it, it's it's an interesting enough of a matchup to probably get some some people to pay for. Yeah, I agree. Well, I appreciate you. Uh taking time out any other items that you'd like to address before we uh, move on there, John? Uh, just, I I'd want to re- just would reiterate what you said, Chris. Uh, I think it is worth looking at the positive though. Hopefully it comes off October 9th, but you know, we're so looking forward to it when it was first set and got delayed. If Fury Wilder three comes off with the intri- intriguing main event with two uh, compelling characters in Fury and Wilder, and that undercard of all heavyweights. I mean, that's what boxing needs, and that's going to be, you know, a PBC top rank collaboration. Credit to both of them, then. But, you know, that's yeah. really what PBC needs, then, with, with all this, you know, they've they got the events out there, but with this run of pay per view, at least to just have one that good, uh, that would help a lot. And uh, that, frankly, would even just kind of get you a better taste going into Canelo plan, I think, even though that's got its own merits. Um, and then I would just say one final wrap up on the Pacquiao uh, thing. I, I, I mentioned some takes I, I didn't really agree with, but you know, some of the takes I did agree with that. And I, people I think were even making some good points over the last pit day or two. I saw one good point by a Twitter boxing person today saying, and I, I think it's a valid point. We don't actually look at it exactly this way that really it's, it's when a fighter is lost so much that he, he, his entertainment value is being lost and people don't want to see him anymore is that's when they're going to hang up the gloves because they can't make the money anymore. In other words, saying like that, yeah, yeah, going to go on because you know, he, he didn't, he didn't get knocked out yet. And it doesn't mean he's going to win, but uh, you know, that's why I'm looking at it. But yeah, he, di- he didn't get knocked cold or something like that or, or completely beat up and stopped. Uh, it, He's got obviously, as you and I have both talked about, he's still got kind of these diehard fans out there. And like you said, I, I do see scenarios too, like you know maybe maybe the spin as he fights somebody in the UK or you know so, some some other thing that's just intriguing enough that you know he, he probably figures he's got at least at least one more pay per view. Uh, so I think he'll even though he's getting at a very advanced age, forty three in December we probably haven't seen the last of him because as long as there's money there, he's probably going to still keep going out there. There you have it. Well, you have yourself a good night and uh, we'll talk next week. All right, Chris, thanks for having me as always. Have a good night. Yep. Have a good one. Thank you. All righty. So that was uh, John giving his takes like he does pretty much on a weekly basis. Um, and yeah, actually the 27th Estrella TV has a card. Telemundo has a card that night too. Uh, that one's from Plant City, Florida. Showtime had a card, uh, August 28th, but David Benavidez, uh, came down with the, so that one got, um, delayed. This one's from Birmingham, England, Akeem Ennis Brown and Sam Maxwell. 
I see some UK fans talking about that. Keep an eye out for that one. Um, as far as the you know the undercard goes, Charles Conwell is on the card, an up and coming 54 pounder. Um, Daniel Dubois is on the card. Easy fight for him, more than likely. Same with uh, Tommy Fury. It does kind of seem like they're lining up Tommy Fury, which makes sense putting him on the card. And maybe, you know, if, if in fact Jake does win, they could have him right in the ring. Uh, Amanda Serrano is in a fight she should win fairly easy, but it's always fun to watch her. I would say the undercard is like prospect in, in, in you know, a, a champ like Amanda Serrano. I think that's dope that she's hot, that Jake kind of sounds like went out of his way to say that's who I want on the card. So big shots out to Amanda Serrano. Dude. That That's dope for her. I love that she's getting it. And, you know, there was supposed to be a better fight, but there just, I guess, wasn't enough money to um, have the uh, other fighter uh, want that fight. There is a competitive fight on, on the books anyway. I've been branching against Montana Love. Right now, um, I can only see him as Montana as like a plus 194. Okay, here's some other plus uh, 150, plus 175. This is from uh, ProBoxingOdds.com, which is a great, great website, by the way, if you're into betting on uh, you know, ProBoxingOdds.com. It gives you a variety of different sites. That's what's really cool about it. Keeps you up date. But, yeah, just looking at it, Jake Paul Woodley, I kind of gave my take on it. Um, you know, I see him as a favorite, but just barely. You look at it, FanDuel has him as a minus 190. I think minus 175 is the lowest. Otherwise, they're mostly up 190, uh, minus 200. Do we have a plus 200 available? I don't think so for Woodley. That wouldn't really make sense. I think the highest one I see is a plus 165. Plus 148, plus 160, uh, Tyron Woodley. And, and the one thing I'll say about Jake is, I say straight punching and all that, and his dedication to the craft to an extent, right? Um, all things considered. Um, he looks like he's taking his time in there. And if you look at the last three, four years, especially these last, like, two, I think he's probably be getting better boxing sparring than Woodley uh, on average, camp in and camp out. Um, so the patience level that we've seen Jake, I like that about him too. Yeah, he's looking for the knockout, like John said, but he's not just throwing shots to throw shots. He is coming in there patient. I do want to see him take a, a pretty big shot, you know. Obviously, they've probably seen him take some, you know, healthy shots, big shots in sparring, but that is with bigger gloves. Obviously, the headgear as far as side of the head, top of the head, even ear, right? You can really get discombobulated pretty easy when you get hit on the side of the head or top of the forehead. But I do like that patience, and I think that's a difference too. I think I actually think that the opening round or two is going to be kind of slow. Because I think Woodley's going to respect the power, and I think Jake's going to respect Woodley. Um, if you know, if one of the guys aren't respecting the other, I think then we could see an early stoppage. I'm not sold that it goes eight rounds, 100%. I'll say that. I do kind of want to see you could spar, spar, spar all these rounds, but until you get in there, it's kind of like uh, you know game shape, right, for football right now. You know, at the beginning of camp, people were like, I still got to get in game shape. You see that with the NBA. My legs aren't in game shape yet. You still got to go those eight rounds. You see prospects in boxing get to, uh, you know, finally do a 10-rounder and get that second win and look kind of gassed, but then, you know, get over the hump. And that helps you in general, not just mentally, but physically. Uh, yeah, sure, mentally it helps you. you. You know you can do it. You know you can bounce back. You know you get that second win. But until you do it, it is different, you know, under the lights and whatnot. So I do have Jake Paul, and I think it'll be more of a TKO variety. I wouldn't be shocked if it went the distance, and I wouldn't be shocked if, like I mentioned, the first round or two is kind of slow, some fun stuff from two, three-ish to, you know, six and seven. 
but I, yeah, I definitely wouldn't be shocked if the last two rounds or something is a little sloppy. Um, now, they're not going the 12-round distance. Then I guarantee if they're around anything past eight you know, or nine, they'd be really tired. But um, it'll be interesting, that inside stuff, too. Like I said, I think Woodley has the advantage, much like Logan Paul. I used that example. It's not a great example, though, because Logan was so much bigger than Floyd. And so he could really, you know, hold him, like really, you know, grasp onto him, clasp, you know. And whereas Jake Paul, I don't think, I, I don't think he's going to be getting pushed around a ton. And if you have a foundation in wrestling, as far as you know, leverage and all that, like I mentioned, I think that definitely helps. Woodley has a way better resume and pedigree as an amateur, but. And don't get me wrong, Woodley might try to do the rough stuff. It might try to get on the inside and land kind of sloppy. You know, maybe maybe that's what we, I haven't really mentioned. Maybe he should just get rough and tumble and try to throw those hooks on the inside that, oops, there's an elbow. You know, I'm not saying cheat, but why not rough him up? You got the one hand free, why not hit him on the side of the head? I, I know people will say, oh, that's blasphemy. Uh, you know, some people out there, but that's that's what we see. We see people getting hit on the side of the head. Shit, uh, Mike Sayo just hit old boy on the ear. You know, shit happens in a fight, and why not get rough and tumble and grapple? You're going to have, more than likely, you're going to have the advantage on the inside uh, there anyway. Um, I don't know. I, I am going with Jake, but I, I, I do actually think that there's some intrigue here. Um, speaking of intrigue, and this might be something, a lot of, a lot of nothing for something, right? Uh, Jake Donovan, uh, boxing scene.com, uh, released this today. Crawford Porter WBD orders September 2nd purse bid to stream live on its Facebook page. Ooh, we get to watch them put the bids in. Oh my gosh. They're going to have a big display. It's going to be great. No. Um, so yeah, next Thursday, would that be right? Yeah, next Thursday, the minimum allowable bill is a uh, bid. Excuse me, is two hundred thousand. You know, if the zone wants, they don't have Crawford, or sorry, they don't have Canelo this fight, right? And who knows? Maybe the next couple of fights they won't. You know, this would be a good time to do it. This would be a good time to do it. But don't be shocked. Mark my words. Of course, that's I'll have a show before that too. I did get my guest on the bid, but on the purse bid, but don't be shocked if it's short, you know, a little short on the Porter side. Don't be shocked if, if they don't do the fight and they fight Thurman instead or something like that, or fight Ugas, <laughs> right? Fight Ugas part two. You can, I could see that. I'm not, I, I really think that Bob will do very similar to what he did for Tia Fimo and Cambosos. He, he actually offered a little bit more than the minimum. So I, I do think, well, I don't think he'll offer, he's going to have to offer more than the minimum. I mean, on both sides of it, you know, so, so Cambosos was going to get paid somewhat, right? But in the end, Tia Fimo was going to get a little bit more than is guaranteed. I don't, I don't think that'll be the case on the top rank side, obviously with the money they owe Crawford on that one. But, I think they'll be willing to maybe give more than just a million on that side, um, you know, to, to Porter. It's a 60-40 split. Keep that in mind. Um, but anyway, yeah, we'll, we'll see. You know, we got another show, you know, after that or before that. A couple of days ago, this is Jake Donovan uh, again, excuse me, from uh, Boxing Scene. Gervonta Davis issued deadline by WBA to confirm, you know, which – which title he's going to defend? Is it going to be 130? Is it going to be 35? Or is it going to be 40? Um, side note, Tank and company, um, they were taken off on a jet, and it crashed off to the, you know, it, it, I guess it got off the air and just crashed. Like, I think it got off. There was like a wheel that came off. I saw that. But he's like, I'm taking a train. Or, or a, a, a the car, right? We're going to drive tour buses or something like that, or, or the Charlo uh, vehicle that he takes from Houston to Dallas. Um, that's pretty scary. But, yeah, it'll be interesting to see 
where Tank is going to fight next. Um, so he does, you know, the, the matter has been addressed Friday via official letter, a copy of which has been obtained by BoxingScene.com with a one-week uh, deadline to clarify at which weight he plans to campaign and defend his WBA title. And this was last Friday. So we should know more about, a little bit anyway, about what Tank's, uh, you know, folks are thinking, his people, what they're thinking is going to be next. Speaking of Tank, we now got the numbers back as far as uh, the gate. Uh, um, Gervonta Davis and, and Mario Barrios, and it was a $4.5 million gate, which is over $4 million taking away the comps. Tickets sold 13000 The gate was 4.5 and change, right? Uh, a lot of change, really, $37,000, almost $38,000. But four point, just getting over $4 million, that actually tops the Wilder Ortiz Part 2. But the amount of boxers that get over, we've already talked about this, 2 or $3 million even. But to get over $4 million at the gate, Barrios is not a popular fighter, as we know. I mean, that's impressive. His last one was like 2.2, I think, there. So he damn, he, he almost doubled it. I mean, straight up. like that. To get over $4 million, that's impressive. That is really, really impressive. Like, for instance, Canelo's fights in Vegas lately have been right around $8 million, Danny Jacobs and, uh, I believe, Kovalev. Um, Pacquiao's fights. I think they were both over six million Thurman and Broner. Like it just doesn't happen a whole lot. Obviously, anytime Anthony Joshua fights, it's going to be you know over five million, uh, way more over that sometimes, right? So he's had fights that were, I think his top one was what twelve or thirteen or something like that million. Those stadium fights will do ten million tops or you know plus. So that's freaking huge. That is really really big. And we alluded to this not long ago. Michael Coppinger, Triller's Ryan Kavanaugh, tells ESPN contracts been, have been being sent today for Tiafimo Lopez and George Campos' title fight. To think that this thing was supposed to happen in June, that's crazy. Um, will take place Tuesday, another Tuesday, at the Hulu Theater, October 5th, New York's Hulu Theater at MSG. And it's basically 20 bucks for the paper. Or it says two ninety nine as part of a monthly subscription. Um, uh, the ticket prices are very good, so go out and see them. If you're going to go there, go go get the tickets. The twenty bucks, you know, maybe now that they they maybe they drop the prices so they could do those two million in sales. That you know they said they were going to do two million uh, pay per views, not in sales. Two million in pay per views. Remember, that's what uh. The Teofimo Lopez Sr. and Jr. were saying that they're going to sell out a stadium and they're going to do two million. And now, I guess, dropping it to twenty, they think they can still get the two million. I, at least they did it, though. You know, would I? I'd rather it be ten, but twenty bucks. At least they're not charging full price for that fight. So I give them, you know, credit for that. Like I said, if you want, if you're in New York City or the surrounding areas, this might be a good event to go to just in general because, hey, why not? You know what I mean? Why not? Like, it, it, it really seems like this. We talked about how it seems like this is Coppinger again. Mikey Garcia and Eddie Hearn are in discussions about a return to the ring September 18th on Mexican Independence Weekend. Garcia was in talks to fight Regis Kroger at the zone, but now trending toward a stay-busy fight. Regis said... It's very disappointing to hear that Matt, Mikey backed out. I was really looking forward to it since they mentioned his name. I've been training even without a date. Mikey is a real guy, and I never would have thought he would back out of this fight. It took me by surprise. Now, it doesn't sound like there was an actual offer sent to either fighter, but that's just speculation. So to say that he backed out, that might be premature. Now, he hasn't fought in a while, Um but, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if that's that's true. Uh, some other stuff from Coppinger in the WBC, uh, Mauricio Suleiman. He says uh, that 
the WBC has ordered a middleweight title eliminator between Jaime Munguo, Mungia, excuse me, and Sergio Derevchenko. Purse bid will be ordered if no deal struck by September 17th. Mungia had been in talks, talks with Gabriel Zada. Mungia and Derevchenko signed me up for that fight. Um, and it says they've ordered a title eliminator, not an intro. So that's cool, too. Um, some other news. Coppinger's a busy man here. Sources, PBC has signed Elvis Rodriguez to a multi-fight deal. The 140-pound prospect was recently released uh, by Top Rank after an upset from Kenneth Smith Jr. in May. Um, so, you know, we'll see how that goes. See where that goes there. Another one from WBC, that's right. Artura be- Better Biev against Marcus Brown. It'll be his first uh, mandatory order since he won the title in WBC back since 2019, October 2019. And this is now just happening, almost two years. Uh, that's kind of weird. But, um, you know, what does Brown have left? I don't know, man. It's I'm not saying that's a bad fight, but, uh, you know, what's he got next on that one? You know, I don't, I don't really know about that one. Um, some other news out there. This is Salvador Rodriguez uh, from ESPN Deportes. Former heavyweight champ Andy Ruiz, recovering from a knee surgery, hopes to fight in December. So he got this one in Guadalajara, Mexico. His right knee, I believe it was. He underwent, this is the quotes from it, this is the Ruiz Sr. He underwent a surgery on his right knee. He had been struggling with that knee for about three years. He could not run very much. He could not do certain movements. Uh, so he used the gel to mitigate the pain, but it was not enough. He made decision to get the procedure done. Um, it's the same doctor that Canelo got his knee done to. So hopefully he's back. Uh, even if it's not December, just back in general. Some other news, Edgar Berlanga will appear on the Fury Wilder undercard October or yeah, October 9th. Then he will be um, in Madison Square Garden December 11th, and that's that Heisman date. Then he will fight uh, in Puerto Rico, where he's enormously popular. If all goes well, he will fight in June at the Garden in conjunction with the Puerto Rican Day Parade. That's what Bob Aram said via Sky Sports for Berlango. So he does have a nice little, probably a nice tune-up, then hopefully a decent fight December 11th, October 9th to December 11th. We'll see. Then they said he's going to go to, you know, what, what's that make it? Probably March or something like that to Puerto Rico. And then in June, which is what, is, isn't it the first week in June? Maybe it's the second week. We can do that. They have the Puerto Rican Day Parade there in New York City. So he's got his schedule planned out, which is always good for a young fighter, especially, right? Um, so we'll see. We'll see how that goes. We were talking about Matchroom USA and the zone in general. Right now, Golden Boy or Matchroom USA, Eddie Hearn, no fight cards at all scheduled. None. Zip, zero, zilch. Um, and this is kind of, I mean, literally Matchroom USA hasn't had a fight since May 29th, Haney and Linares. And I kind of thought, you know, they had other fights, so it didn't really click. And then I was like, oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, I guess I didn't realize that it, you know, I knew they had Golden Boy cards and stuff, but I guess I didn't realize Matchroom USA. So the plan was, I guess, not to be in June and July, which is kind of fun in general. But they were saying, you know, at the time, this is from Dan Raphael, that they, you know, they needed to know about Alvarez, if it, if, if Canelo was going to be on, on the platform in the fall or not. Um, and otherwise, they're not committing to a, a fall U.S. schedule. Obviously, uh, the zone budget will be dramatically different if Alvarez is on the zone this fall or if he's elsewhere. Um, they're talking about two American dates. Uh, there are two American dates, however, that Hearn is working on, according to sources, even if it's not set in stone. One is September 18th on the West Coast. I don't know. Um, the undercard would likely be Soto against Gonzalez, El- Elwin Soto, and Jonathan Gonzalez. A good fight. That might be the Mikey Garcia one. 
Uh, there's also probably an October one, which would be uh, Juan Francisco Estrada and uh, Roman Chocolatito Gonzalez. So that obviously would be a good one, too. So, uh, but yeah, that's pretty crazy. You know, when Hearn started this thing, he always talked about how, you know, first of all, there was going to be 16 shows a, a year. Match from USA, 16 shows. Um, and he'd say, you know, they're going to be all top to bottom pay-per-view level type cards. And then four absolute monster cards. You know what I mean? That, that's what he always said. And even in t- a couple months ago, in the you know in the middle of the summer, he said, you know, you can't beat our schedule. And he, he actually acted like Showtime. He's like, I don't, I don't think much of their their. I, I remember reading that quote about a month ago. I don't really think much of Showtime's schedule. And if you notice, which we haven't because it hasn't been happening, but he said if you notice, Fox has gotten all the good fights. It's like really well, if you've noticed, Fox hasn't gotten all the good fights beyond pay per view. It's been Showtime that has the best schedule in boxing right now. So, I mean, here we are. You know, I hate to say it living in Minnesota, but we're at the end of August, right? I love me some football, but what football means uh, around these parts, in my neck of the woods, it means the weather's going to get cold. And, and, you know, old man winter's going to be knocking here by November. I mean – Matchroom USA, no June, no July, no August fights at all. And then you, you think you got some schedule coming up? I mean, this is kind of crazy. Like I said, we've been hard on Fox and the you know PBC. We're just spreading the love. Where in the hell? I mean, if this was Fox, or even to a lesser extent, but still, if this was top rank, and all this months have gone by with barely any chatter, they'd be getting destroyed on Fox. Twitter. You notice that that's not the case right now, besides from the hardcores, but you don't see the media stressing that much. Um, so it's kind of kind of like, huh. And by the way, just to follow up what John said last week about uh, Spence's uh, information, Errol Spence Jr. injury was a retinal detachment or break, whatever. Nevada Commission, Bob Bennett tells upon reviewing the, um, the exam, conducted by Dr. Thomas F. Kelly on August 9th. Uh, Dr. Kelly determined Spence was unfit to compete. Um, so just kind of uh, doubling back on that um, on that news. Um, Eddie Hearn was talking about um, – who was it? Was it – Eddie Hearn – this is Talk Sports. Eddie Hearn on his world title plan for Joshua Boazzi. Uh One more fight in November, December, then we move straight into Demetri Bivol uh, fight, probably at the O2 Arena in the spring. And, and Bivol might fight. Um, oh, who was it? Why can't I think of it? Oh, Ryder. You know, we heard uh, that my guy David Morrell Jr. The Cuban fighting out of Minneapolis. That you know they've been trying to work that fight out, and they, you know Hearn's side blamed, you know the Morell side or whatever. There wasn't enough money in it, or they delayed it or whatever. And uh, fine, that's great. But his quote, you know, today was like, "Well, that's a tough fight. This is a tough fight. Why don't we just make the tougher fight for more money?" And and you know that makes a lot of sense. Obviously, that that definitely. Uh, does make some sense when it comes down to it. Uh, but we'll see. I mean, they, they need some big fights. You know, Bivol, this is what it says in boxing scene, uh, Ron Lewis, Dimitri Bivol versus John Ryder could be explored, say, says Eddie Hearn. Um, and this is the quotes he said. It, I might put him in with John Ryder. Uh, Ryder wants it. He's a super middleweight. That's another thing he'd be going up in weight. He's a super middleweight, but it – but is meant to fight Morell for the world title, but that's a tough fight, so why not fight Bivol? I think a lot of people feel Bivol is beatable right now, although he's still unbeaten, and then it goes on to say, you know, uh, I guess he's talking about, oh, I think we're going to box Bivol in October, and Josh will box in November or December, probably in America, after that world title fight, like we said. So, um, yeah, I don't know. 
just interested in seeing Bivol and Better be in, in, in good fights, to be honest with you. Um, on to the boxing Twitter segment. I mean, Dan Raphael, right? This is him in the last round. Round 12, Ugas 10-9, his best round of the fight. Landed so many right hands, and he did. He, like I said, like I was saying, he was thrashing him with that. Pacquiao couldn't answer, but I have Manny winning 7-5. to five. Should be close either way. I don't know how you can give seven rounds to him. I just don't know. This is Philip Michael. Uh, let Manny go fight Conor McGregor. All good things come to an end, and no one wants to see him get destroyed at this age, which will continue or which will happen if he continues. Yeah, I mean, why not? You know, he can do what he ever wanted. Manny Pacquiao, this is him after the fight. I didn't make adjustments early enough. My legs were tight. That's boxing. I'm sorry we lost tonight. I did my best. I don't know if I will retire or not. I will make an announcement regarding my presidential candidacy in the Philippines in one month. See, he doesn't even know if he's 100% running right now. This is Jake Donovan pointing out a really good point. Philippines and U.S. national anthem, but none for Cuba. A vicious reminder that your your Dennis Ugas is truly a B-side. That is crazy. Usually it's like the ref and the two fighters are at least the two fighters, right? You had the U.S. and the Philippines, but you didn't have the – that was crazy. You didn't have the Cuban uh, anthem. That one sucked. Okay, now on the boxing Twitter, even heavier. Boy, some of this stuff, man, I'll tell you. <laughs> oh, boy. Um, oh, news-wise, we already kind of covered – yeah, we already did the, the, the Canelo one. Sounds like, even though it's a one-fight deal, that David Benavides and Charlo, there's a good chance that it's next. We'll see them. Um, oh, listen to this. Plant has done – hasn't – excuse me. Plant hasn't done a damn thing to earn that either in the fight. Canelo was the one who fought and beat the other champions. Plant shouldn't win all the belts if he won, which he won't. So this guy's saying – if Plant beats Canelo, he shouldn't get all the belts. <laughs> what? If you beat someone, whatever belts on the line you get, unless you don't want it, and you you know you get to a place where you're a star and you're like, I'm good, I'll just take this belt, the other one, kind of like, um, well, it's happened numerous times with Mayweather Mosley, for instance. You know, Floyd left the belt, you know, by the wayside, but to say. Plant shouldn't win all the belts if he wins the fight. <laughs> what the fuck? So Canelo is officially occupied. Better be is Better be of is on the second half of his 37th year on Earth. Him and Bivol are still pretending each other doesn't exist. Yeah, seriously, dude. That's the thing. Like, and we talk about that. If you don't have enough roster at a weight class, you end up not wanting to match your guys and. Although I like Eddie Hearn, I think he's a great promoter. At the zone, they don't really like to, unless they're, they're the little guys, they don't really like to match up their guys. I mean, he's even said as much. I, I've played recording him saying, I'd rather them fight them and then maybe match them up. Like, you know, if you got the guys, you got to match them up because in the, three, you know, in the era where we have three big, you know, PBC top rank and match room, uh, we say match from USA. I don't know, but just don't. You know, I say, I guess there's four because Showtime, Fox for now anyway, and ESPN and Zone. It's like, hey, if you got guys at that weight class, you need to match them up, dude, because it's hard enough to get a big enough interest in a fight where cross promoting makes sense and splitting, uh, you know, events makes sense. So you're just not going to split for no reason, right? So when you got some guys and you talk shit like you got, you know, you were saying, you know, Charlo can't get a, a middleweight fight without coming to the zone. Well, make some of those damn fights. We'll see, though. Um, I like how Ugas is reacting to this victory. A lot would be doing cartwheels right now. His demeanor tells me he has more to do in the sport, and I like it. That's very well said. That is very, very well said. Uh, Eddie Hearn has insisted he's moving away from YouTube fights to focus on serious boxing. Boxing needs to stand up and be counted. The only way is to make great fights 
I've done the YouTube before. We had a bit of fun. It was a cringe, uh, to be honest. That's what he said to Talk Sport. It's like, all right, then stand up and make the fight then, dude. Um, the stupidest thing in boxing is that 115 and 118 are different weight classes. Combined, it would be a deep division with lots of great fights. Yeah, that is uh, that is a funky one. That, you got to admit, that one's a funky one. Oh, this is pretty cool. Uh, Clarissa Shields has Clar- Clarissa Shields Street. Um, it's a, she said, you know, my childhood street is being named after me. That's dope. That's really good for her. I like that, man. That, that's, that's really cool. That, that's dope. By the way, that WBO purse bid planned for September 2nd between Crawford and Sean Porter is going to be 12 Eastern. So that's what, 6 UK or 5 UK time PM. So high noon on the East next Thursday. Okay, um, I'm going to go ahead and see if Portland uh, can is ready to go. Let's see. Otherwise, I'll probably shut it down. There is some more boxing Twitter, but I don't want to just overdo it too much with it. You know what I mean? Oh, one more here. Between Spence, this is from John, actually. Between Spence not being hurt and Ugas being hurt, it was a real bad week, a bad couple of weeks for Twitter boxing positions. Yeah, that is a good, that is a good point. Oh, here's another one. Look at Barbershop Conversations. So this is two different names of, or labels of, uh, labels. Uh, well, I suppose you're labeling the video. But the title of his YouTube videos, another fixed WBA PBC fixed fight. Another fixed WBA and PBC fixed fight. He said fixed twice. Ugas fighting with an injured arm and charging fans 75 bucks. Then after the fight, Ugas dominates Pacquiao and showed great will with an arm injury. <laughs> it's like, oh, but I thought it was fixed. What happened there? People in boxing are so prideful they can never admit they're wrong. People blame Plant for failed negotiation, despite the report saying the holdup was Canelo in box. Um, now that the deal is back on, Plan is selling his belt. You can, are you ever think maybe he thinks he can win? Yeah, all of a sudden now he's selling his belt, but before he was ducking. It's like, well, which one is it, dude? Which one is it? All right, we're going to go out to Portland and shut this show down with 503. 503 Portland, man, what is going on, buddy? Hey yo, hey yo, what up, what up, Chris? How y'all? I'm doing good here in uh, beautiful, uh, sunny Oregon. For the meantime, man, I hear you, Chris. It's gonna start getting cold in this in this mother effort, but uh, you know what I mean. But uh, I guess uh, we have to deal with it. But uh, how's everything? How's everything, Chris? How you doing, brother? I'm doing pretty good, man. I'm doing pretty good. I thought we had a fun fight card and, uh, you know, a great win for Ugas, man, because he really put on what I thought was his best performance as a pro. Yeah, yeah, definitely, man. And uh, shout out to uh, Robert Guerrero, Victor Ortiz for uh, putting it on. Uh, You know, if I could talk about that fight real fast first, uh, the national anthem goes to them. Uh, uh, You know, it was a back and forth fight. Uh, you know, uh, the Robert Guerrero did show guts. Uh, both guys showed guts. It was a good, fun fight for, for you know, for the uh, leading into the main event. So, you know, shout out to both of them. And uh, but Robert Guerrero look, looks like he uh, got the win, and uh, uh, he goes, he moves forward. And um, you know, with this, with this win, I wouldn't mind uh, him uh, with some maybe some fun fights out there. Uh, maybe like a Brandon Rios, uh, uh, you know, those kind of caliber fighters. Uh, remember Andre Berto. Uh, if he wants to come back, you know, there's still uh, maybe, you know, even Adrian Broner, like that would be a great fight, you know, uh, Broner versus uh, Robert Guerrero. I think that would, would be fun as a Showtime uh, uh, card. Um, but yeah, and then, um, but also uh, let's get uh, let's get into the uh, the, the main event, uh, Pacquiao, Ugas, and uh, if I could say something real fast, man, if I could, you know, we uh, prior to this fight, two weeks leading into it, I uh, believe Spence had a a torn uh, retina or something, something with his eye. And, uh, man, I just felt bad that he had to, you know, pull out it for injury. And, uh, 
but uh, you know, it, you know, but but with this, uh, but with this loss came a big opportunity for a big uh, for uh, for like just a, a great person uh, in Ugas, uh, Jordanis Ugas, man from Cuba, a real you know real fighter, man, and uh, I can't be not happy for this guy, man. I'm happy, uh, you know, he he definitely, man, he looked great in this fight. Um, you know, Chris, uh, I, I texted you uh, the the last week during the you know during the. Uh, your show, and I told you that I, you know, uh, I thought, uh, in my opinion, I thought Manny Pacquiao was going to win by decision, and um, you know, but uh, but uh, I was rooting for uh, for Jordani Sugas because he's, you know, he, he's a Latino. I was always rooting for the, my Latino brothers, and uh, so uh, you know, uh, but I thought Pacquiao was going to win by decision. I didn't think because uh, I was, you know, I saw some of uh, Ugas fights leading into this fight, and I, you know, he is good and everything, but I just didn't think he was going to bring that kind of a uh, that that you know that level the you know what I mean and um because he you know he had to he had to you know he did have some pretty good wins you know Figueroa and then there was that uh, fight with uh, uh, Sean Porter which I thought he won that fight so uh, but I just didn't think because of that situation I didn't think they would ever give Ugas a uh, a victory you know like like that like a, like a decision victory which was crazy and um, but he earned it man you know uh, Ugas looked good. He put, you know, he uh, he was right there in front of uh, Pacquiao all, all like all night, you know, countering him and, uh, with those beautiful right hands, and setting him up, uh, setting him up with jabs. And uh, man, he he definitely made Manny Pacquiao look like ordinary, not uh, not gifted that night. Because man, Manny Pacquiao seemed to be having a, a little bit of trouble uh, getting getting to Ugas all night, you know, kind of reaching for punches, and you could tell. Um, you could always tell when a fighter is frustrated when you when you see him doing uh, when you see him uh, doing like uh, certain things like maybe when he gets clipped you know he goes for aggressiveness right at the end of the bell and he's trying to you know get back on the points you know and uh, and also there was that a moment too if you caught that Chris where Pacquiao was kind of hitting after the bell a little bit and uh, you know there was I, I thought that was a little bit of frustration from Pacquiao but yeah. Um, Pacquiao showed, you know, that he still got it. Uh, you know, he didn't, uh, he, even though he did lose by like a, I thought in, in a wide decision, um, I, I just think he could still be there and make some, some entertaining fights, maybe some take, maybe take some time off, but he could still definitely be in, um, some entertainment fights out there. So, and, and then if I could give him some advice, man, like, I know he's not gonna take advice from me, you know what I mean? But he, it looks like he's going to become president soon of the Philippines. And uh, but like looks like maybe he he is kind of kind of still uh, dipping into fights. So I would tell him to like you know kind of like make some uh, funny events where you're fighting MMA fighters or uh, maybe some some I don't know just just somebody that, like a like a YouTuber or something. What's up, McGregor? McGregor. Yeah, McGregor. McGregor. McGregor would be actually an excellent fight, you know, because you know McGregor he's been on a losing streak. He hasn't been looking so good either. Uh, I just think uh, you, that would actually be kind of nice. Actually, you know that that would that would sell d- definitely big time. That would be like a, a big pay per view, even though both men are coming off losses. And uh, but I think uh, the, you know we would eat it up and talk about it. And it, it would be a fun fight, you know. But I would tell Pacquiao to like kind of stay in those kind of level fights. It just seems, uh, you know, I, I just think he, if he does fight Porter, he does fight Crawford or Spence. I do think at this point. Uh, he doesn't have it anymore to to stay. He, I think he'll he won't get knocked out um, by either uh, either three of those fighters. But I do think he would be there uh, all twelve rounds. But uh, but probably lose. Um, just just seeing that uh, just seeing this fight after with Ugas just seemed like he lost some some steps. You know, like he did seem a little slower. Uh, it seemed like you know he didn't have his feet there. Um, his his like agility you know wasn't there. Uh, and he kept getting clipped, man, with those right hands. And he, I don't know, for some reason, he just didn't see him coming. Or, you know, the guy, uh, Ugas just had a perfect game plan, just made him look ordinary. So, uh, but yeah, man, and as far as, but as far as that fight, man, shout out to Ugas. Ugas did it for Cuba. And like you said, Chris, earlier, that was messed up how they didn't put the, the Cuban national anthem. But you, you, man, you could, you could definitely, uh, you could definitely feel the presence of the Cubans there, man. Uh, you know, I saw the flags. Waving, um, shout out to shout out to his uh, beautiful wife. You know, hanging, being there. You know that. You know that she's. You know she's definitely, uh, uh, definitely a prize. And uh, but uh, yeah. But as far as Ugas, man, uh, definitely as, as far as Ugas, man, I'm happy for him. 
uh, he is definitely in, in uh, right there now. Like with him going in, like I hope he gets that Spence fight now that you know uh, if if Spence could get healthy and and if he gets healthy later, um, it looks like that fight will probably happen sometime next year now. Um, but I I just really hope that fight happens. And then actually, man, after seeing this, I it, it, I could kind of see an upset happening now with with uh, Spence now too, man. Had him coming with an eye injury into a fight. Um, you know, that's pretty serious, you know, so, uh, but, uh, Ugas looks, Ugas looks come in here. It looks great. Um, so shout out to him. I hope he gets a big, big fight after this. Maybe, uh, uh, may, uh, I don't know, maybe, you know, I would love for a, a, a Porter rematch, but, uh, but I, I'm sure, but I'm, but what I've been hearing is that Porter's got a, a negotiation deal with, uh, Crawford or something with, uh, purse biz or something like that. So, you know, hopefully that fight happens, uh, for Crawford and Porter, but for, uh, but for Ugas, man, I just hope he gets something big. Uh, he deserves it. Um, Spence, Spence is big. Uh, Pacquiao, I'd like to see that fight. I mean, I mean not Pacquiao. I mean, sorry, uh, Mikey Garcia. Mikey Garcia versus uh, Ugas would be nice. Uh, now at this point, because Ugas definitely is a name in this uh, this in this division now. After again, this is a huge win. So, um, uh, but yeah, man. But as far as that, that was it was a good night, Chris. Um, you know. Uh, for, uh, but also too, man. If I can mention, man, after uh, after Spence, uh, you know, withdrew from the fight uh, due to uh, injury, uh, you know, I was hoping, man, like uh, uh, that they lowered the price on this pay per view because they didn't. And in all honesty, right. let's face it, like I just didn't, I just didn't feel like going into the Saturday night. It was I should be paying seventy five dollars, you know, dollars going into this. You know what I mean? And uh, this, obviously, the Spence fight is worth it, but. Man, I just wish, like, damn, yeah. like, you know, they should have lowered it down a little bit. You know? but, too. In the end, I yeah, got that, my money's worth, but going into mm-hmm. it, I agree. It would have been nice if they notched it down 20 bucks or something like that. Yeah, definitely, man. Like, or, or, you know, just something, man, or I don't know, or um, a, a good discount, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, uh, would have been nice, but damn, but yeah, but the 75, but it definitely was uh, worth it. A fight. It was worth it because, you know, the outcome – of of it was uh good you know because i was rooting for ugas and i wanted him to get the win so it, it was kind of worth it but damn that's 75 dollars man that's like damn uh but but yeah and also chris i had a question like uh with this pay-per-view i know i know Blackton, uh always does this to us i mean you know, i'm not I'm, i mean they always like when there's always a pay-per-view card the undercard is always not that great but with this one, like I don't, I don't know why. Uh, why can't we have seen like maybe Adrian Broner on the undercard? Him being, you know, not having a fight for. I think what what did he have a fight earlier this year? I think I believe or late last year. Um, but like why yeah, can't we have seen? Yeah, February. Is he too okay. Well, Was he, is he you gotta remember, on, fighter? On, probably is guaranteed, but on, on paper to have to pay Spence and Pacquiao. It's going to be rough to put a big name on the undercard, you know? Yeah. I just I was just kind of wondering because, you know, like, uh, it's, it's all PVC and stuff. And I was just kind of like, you know, because we haven't seen Adrian Broner in a long time. And, then you know, him being – and it would have actually been kind of cool if he was on the undercard, even with a tune-up. Um, you know, at least we get a name. Or even, like, you know, even Thurman, who hasn't been in the ring since Pacquiao, uh, you know, even if he had a tune-up in the ring – um, uh, let's say he fought Robert, or no, not Robert Guerrero, but like, let's say he fought, uh, maybe Andre Berto in there. Like, I think, uh, I just would have, would have been more of a, a better night than, uh, seeing Robert Guerrero and, uh, was name Victor Ortiz, you know what I mean? Cause like, I just think, I don't know, it pains that $75, you know, that I think, uh, a, you know, a good, a great or a good, uh, would, uh, a co-main event would have been nice, you know what I mean? I just always wondered that, but I could see them being expensive and, and, you know, having to pay all that money. So, but, uh, that was just my little question. But, uh, but as far as that, uh, what, what we got this weekend, Chris, you said that the Benavides fight is, uh, postponed, uh, due to COVID. Yeah, he got COVID. We have the Jake Paul, oh, okay. uh, Woodley fight. Jake Paul okay. Woodley. And that's on, and that's on a Sunday, right? Yeah, it's on Sunday. Yep. I'm glad that you put that Sunday. Sh- it's Sunday. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, because I I noticed that it was on the the 29th and not the 28th. So, but yeah, man, this uh this one, uh, you know, I am definitely buying it. Uh, I um this one is a kind of a fun uh fun fight uh as the you know main event. Uh, so I don't know, man. Uh, you know, this one's kind of tricky. Uh, I I I'm still not 100% uh, uh believe in Jake Paul. Like I still don't. He doesn't have uh. 
the background of a, of, a, of a real fighter, you know, going through the amateurs and going through, uh, you know, what you have to do to be uh, at, at that level. Uh, and, you know, which I mean is like, because uh, he's on like, not on a high caliber level of uh, skills, but he's on a on a uh, on a high platform. I mean, this is a Showtime pay per view, so um, but that that's what I mean. You know what I mean? So, uh, but I don't know. Uh, this one, you know, with Woodley, uh, you know, he's he what he used to be a champion in the UFC, uh, uh, de- decorated wrestler. He had some hands. He does got some all right hands, but he is a little bit of a smaller fighter. Uh, you know, um, you know what? I'm gonna go with uh, with Tyron Woodley in this fight. Um, I told, I, like I said, I, I totally don't, I still don't really believe in Jake Paul. I, you know, uh, 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 like in his skills, like he hasn't really fought anybody of uh, of note. Um, and I know yeah. that Woodley has been in there tougher, like with real opponents. He's faced like you know the uh, he's faced adversity, you know, in, in fights. Um, he, 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 he's taken punches. Uh, I just believe, I don't know if, if, you know, if, if I could, um, if I could say something like if, if Woodley, like, like if Woodley decides to fight in the inside and uses, um, pressure and, uh, you know, good body shots and, uh, you know, kind of, kind of making it rough, dirty, yeah. uh, just rough ugly, I think he, Rumbin Tubble, I think Grapple he can get this dad. victory. I would tell him, do not try to get or, or uh, do not try to box and try to use the shoulder roll like you were saying earlier, Chris. Like I like I understand, yeah. You know, but you know, Floyd should be the only one really. Or uh, if you're tired, or not. I mean, uh, what's his name? Fuck, I forget his name. Um, uh, uh, fuck, I forget his name. But um, uh, the other uh, heavyweight. Uh, fuck, I forget his name. Was that who? Oh, go ahead. No, uh, go ahead. James Tony. James, oh, sorry. James I'm Tony? sorry, James Tony. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, with right, the shoulder yeah. roll. You know what I mean? James Tony and Floyd, they were, they were masters at that, uh, you know, shoulder roll. So, um, but I would tell definitely Woodley, do not try to box this guy. Take the fight to him. Make it rough. Make it dirty. Just make it ugly. Make Put it put it on him. Make it rough. It's only eight rounds. This is not a 12-round fight. Make it ugly. Take the fight to him. Be a Mexican in this fight. Think Brandon Rios. Think Chavez Jr. Or not Chavez Jr. Chavez Sr. You know, think yeah, don't of, you think know, Chavez of, of Jr. Inside Whatever fighting. you do, don't think Chavez no, no. Jr. <laughs> no Chavez <laughs> Jr. <laughs> no, not Jr. Senior, I mean, definitely senior. Just have that mentality <laughs> of bringing the fight to him. Yeah. Like, don't make it. Don't make it tough on you and think this guy's got some sort of skills where he's going to outbox you. Don't give him the range. He's a bigger and taller dude. He's got the height. He seems he's got the reach advantage. And that just seems like if he, if if uh, if Jake Paul decides to fight on the outside, I think I believe that would be better for him. Uh, but Woodley definitely has to come in and try to make it ugly, uh, uh, an ugly fight. I think in my in my opinion for him to get the victory. Uh, but uh, just just but I don't know. I think just sheer toughness, and he's not that old either. I think he's 39. Um, you know, uh, <laughs> there's been a lot of fighters that still, you know, could do good things or great things at 40. Um, so I, I just believe he's not, he, you know, he, uh, he hasn't seen his, uh, his worst days, I believe. Um, even though he does got, he had a little bit of a skid row in, um, in MMA or the UFC or whatever, but, uh, but this guy's no fighter. I don't know. Jake, Jake Paul is no fighter to me. He's just some guy that capitalized on a, on an opportunity to be a boxer. And now he's here and he's, you know, he's doing it. So. Uh, you know, we're watching. So, but uh, I, but in my opinion, like I said, uh, um, uh, Woodley is the real fighter, and I'm gonna go based off of that. So, uh, I do got Woodley, um, and I'm gonna say uh, late round uh, TKO. I'm gonna go by late round TKO uh, for uh, Woodley, and um, that is my final decision. But as far as and you know, and and, um, and also let me talk about the. Uh, I would I believe in my opinion. The fight of the night and the, the the fight that people should be more interested in and is that that this Amanda Serrano uh, versus uh, Yamalita Mercado. You know, shout out to Mexico. I'm put I'm I'm, I'm rooting for my girl Yamalita Mercado. She's Mexican. I'm sorry, uh, Amanda Serrano, but I believe you're gonna get taken <laughs> out. 
you know, you you want. I know you're looking for that uh, that knockout record. I think I believe you were talking about something about Christy Martin's. You want to beat her, Christy Martin's record or something right. like that. But let me tell you, I'm a lead that's going to take you to school. Um, Mercado por Mexico. You know, uh, that's uh, that's what I want to say. I would tell definitely the casual fans, uh, hardcore fans, and MMA fans to stay tuned to this one because I, I believe this is the real fight of the night. Um, WBC, WBO, feather, uh, featherweight uh, world titles on the line. Uh, I mean, if you if you have seen Amanda Serrano, uh, she is definitely a fan favorite uh, fighter. Uh, she brings the heat. She always tries to go for the knockout. She always brings it. Um, what can I say about it? She's she's definitely the real deal. So, but in my honest opinion, I got Yamalis Mercado uh, Mercado winning this uh, this weekend for a, a, an upset. Put it down, Chris. Mexico all day. Uh, I'm rooting for mines, man, and uh, that you know the, it should be a good night. I'm not too familiar with the um, well the with the other uh, with the undercard, but uh, I'm definitely staying tuned to this uh, this card. I'm buying it. Um, it should be fun. That's all. I, that's all I got to say about this card. You know, don't take it for too much. Uh, you know what I mean? Uh, for what it is, you just take it for what it is. You know what I mean? It should. It just should just be a, a fun night, a, a fight on a Sunday night. So. Um, but, uh, yeah, and uh, as far as that, yo, Chris, I don't have too much to say. Uh, it sucks that, that the Benavides fight is postponed due to COVID. Everybody be safe out there. Yo, Chris, thank you for uh, having me on. Viva Roca del Radio and Viva Mexico, cabrones. Yes, sir. Thanks for calling in. I want They should put that as the co-feature uh, November 6th for uh, Canelo and Plant. Put Benavides on the co-feature. What do you think about that? I would, yeah, that, I would love it. You know, now that – do you hear me? Yeah, yeah. I'm with Yo, Chris, you hear me? Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I love it, man. I love it. Uh, if they could do that. Um, and, and also, don't forget about Jose Benavides, too. He he should, he was supposed to be on all this undercard. I want to see That's how right. he does yep. with the PBC. You know what I mean? So I don't want to forget about, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the also the, the other brother. You know what I mean? But, uh, yeah, as far as that, that would be great. On uh, on the undercard of Plant Canelo, and like you said earlier too, Chris, man, uh, you know this uh, this fight looks like it's still up in the air. It looks like it's uh, it's it's almost official, or it is official now. I don't know what it is, but it seems like it was uh, off, but now it's oh, it's official. Yeah, because Canelo and that side has actually said the date and all that, so it's just a matter of uh, the tickets going on sale and all that. November sixth. Oh, okay. Oh, it's November 6th. Okay. Yeah, see, they could, uh, if I, I'm like, yeah, like, since that got postponed, they could put it on there. And just in case Plant, maybe, I don't even, this is just a, a, a fantasy, but if Plant somehow, sure. um, something right. happens, you know, out of the blue, I would love for Benavides right. to, you know, step in there. But, I mean, you know, things could always change. Who knows what the hell could happen. But uh, that is a great idea, Chris. I would love that, you know what I mean? But, you know, it has an insurance for both men, you know, just, in, just, there's, just in case something happens, this fight was either fight is still great, you know, either uh, Plant or uh, um, what's his name, uh, Benavides. But uh, you know, but as far as that, but the the Plant is the the fight to talk about because he is the one with with the belt, the last belt, yeah, you know, the the last stone, you know, the last stone for Thanos, man. So, uh, but yeah, and uh, but yeah, man. As far as that, yo, Chris, uh, yeah, don't like I said, I don't have too much to say, but yes, but uh, you know me, I'm always rooting for the Mexicanos. Uh, Canelo should get that one, uh, you know, uh, but I hope both men do uh, make it to the fight. Um, like you said, Chris, I do like that undercard. If uh, they move that Ugatsuki Benavides on that, that would be great. Um, since there, I, I don't believe there is an undercard yet for the uh, for that no, event. Uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, they right. definitely would love that. But, yeah, so, but, yeah, man, uh, yeah, like I said, Chris, we will love the dub. Viva Mexico, cabrón. Yes, sir. Appreciate you calling in. And, you know, I mean, my guess is that Benavides, without a belt, his guarantee might not be as much. So maybe that would be doable. Of course, now Showtime had the fight. So is Showtime going to be cool on letting that go? That's a little funky. And not so much just the replacement, but just pumping up Benavides for the next potential matchup with Canelo, too. Just being on the same card helps. And that is a WBC title eliminator for Canelo's belt, uh, that fight. So that puts Benavidez, because, of course, he dropped it on the scale, and so he would have fought twice since then, I guess technically three times, because he fought that night that he dropped the belt. But, it, you know, it, that means he got his, you know, had some fights, got back 
you know, in the rankings and then would turn into a title eliminator. So that's something you can talk about on the fight too. and just have Benavidez there. I'd assume you have Benavidez there anyway. And, it, you know, now that I think about it, Showtime did buy the fight. So if they want the fight again, I guess, you know, they already did. They own the fight or whatever right now. So I guess that's part of it too. It just would be fun to have a, a, a decent name, a guy that has a lot of potential to be, a bigger name in David, David Benavidez, and obviously a future opponent. All right, we'll be back next week. Enjoy the fights this weekend. Uh, peace. Once you become the world champion, I believe that you feel you have the upper hand. So now, when, as you fight, let's say you fight for five years, a straight survival, a bullshit, a whole bag, and when you become the world champion, you're like, you know what, I made it. I'm going to show you 